right, what is up, my beautiful people? I am back. Y'all thought you could get rid of me because the internet went out? Nope. Can't get rid of me here. Yeah, apologies. You can tell how amateur I am by all of the last minute adjustments to my stream and setup. How is everybody doing? Uh, recently got a new update to Starlink. So that whole hanky pank, do si do with the internet is a saga I'm not going to get into here. Instead, I am hitting the ground running. I have three different YouTubers that I need to respond to. Now, as you well know, I am a salty cracker and I like to get into debates on YouTube. I don't really have open comments. YouTube has now three times uh, muted me for my comments because I like to start a little bit of a mess in comment sections. And as y'all very well may know, this is actually a deliberate strategy by me in order to garner, let's just say the public temperature as it pertains to evolutionism, materialism, et cetera, and see what people's views are on the origin of the universe. Now, personally, I'm not interested in religious arguments for this. I think intelligent design is something I'm going to go over later on in the critique for history as alternative hypotheses do, do vary, they apply here. And also some of the people I'm covering today aren't wholesale with the narrative. Uh, for example, I'm going to be responding to Clint's reptiles. And while Amon Ra or Anon Ra, whatever his name is, and Stephen Milo are both staunch atheists, Clint actually does believe in creationism, but believes in macroevolution and microevolution as scientific concepts. And as you well know, I have a lot of holes that I have poked in macroevolution all throughout the ages. And going through my series, I realized that I was sitting on a lot of the same points the entire time. And as I'm going further into the Jurassic, going over dinosaurs and stuff, I realized that I also want the series to take another direction. As eventually things will wrap up, and there are many points that I want to get to that I'm not willing to wait months and months to get to. And early human evolution is one of those. That's part of what I'm going to be responding to today. But also, I just want to start responding to a lot of the YouTubers that I see, because I watch so many science-related YouTube videos about all kinds of subjects, everything from forging bronze all the way to regular animal stuff like biomes and basic biology videos. So everything in between, every gamut. So don't think that I'm just living under a rock and I don't know the evidence. Like I have a bachelor's degree in zoology from a California polytechnic. I got good grades and I went to school and I studied and I was a good noodle. And I retain much of that information. As you well know, I use sources in most of my videos. Uh, even if I don't publish a source openly, I will often show my sources directly on screen most of the time. I have dozens, if not hundreds, of scientific papers saved that I reference. And many times people are like, oh, source, source, can I get a source, source? To those people who get into these spats with me in comment sections, if you happen to watch my videos, I have sources there. It's like if, you, if you're one of these people who are like rage, I'm like shaking the table. I'm over, like being a total spaz. But if you're one of those people that is like, source, source, can I get a source, source, source? Like, where's the source, bro? Like, get a source, bro, source, source. And the source is in the video. Oftentimes, I do link papers. And today, I'm breaking this down like a Walmart shotgun. Because there's a couple people I want to cover just real quick. Uh, the first one I'm going to get to is Stephen Milo. This, is, this concerns early human evolution. I have another guy, Amon Ra, that I want to respond to. And the reason I'm responding to these guys is because they present themselves as authorities on this subject. Just as how I label my channel as entertainment, definitely not kid-friendly, but like still entertainment. These guys have oftentimes, especially guys like Clint or, or Stephen Milo, a much more sanitized image that could appeal to adolescents or could appeal to people who just know nothing about the subject. And they're meant to be casually consumed. So uh, Clint especially, like he'll read children's books and stuff on his channel. But the narrative that they're spewing and what they're going with, it would be one thing if it was like the Mormons or whatever, like they have their theories, whatever, uh, but they're contained. Like no one's actually trying to go out and call you a bigot because you don't adhere to Mormonism, except, you know, maybe some more, I don't know, Mormons don't usually do that kind of stuff, but you get my drift. But people in academia are actively trying to shame people intellectually and froth at the mouth and be like, oh, yeah. oh, ignoramus, where'd you get me all degree? Did you <laughs> And it's honestly really exhausting. I, I absolutely despise the fact that 
something as scientifically not proven, something as scientifically disproven as macroevolution and abiogenesis respectively are taken as such factual information in the modern day. And what, why is this? I've already broken down why abiogenesis doesn't make sense in one of my earliest live streams. If you haven't seen my abiogenesis live stream, you ain't a day one. But that was my roughest edit. Like I didn't even show my face for that first live stream, but I did a much more comprehensive in-depth abiogenesis episode later. And essentially what that boils down to, no pun intended, is Louis Pasteur disproving spontaneous generation over a century ago. And with the boiled chicken flask, with the boiled flask experiments, the man basically proved only life can beget life. It's one of the most foundational tenets. It's like the right hand rule of biology. Only life can beget life. It is the bedrock foundation upon which modern biology is built. Because understand that life was not will not just spontaneously spawn out of thin air, that inanimate matter cannot just spontaneously create living things. We waged forward with all of this scientific discovery. Until we get to guys like Richard Dawkins and Stephen Hawking and all of these other wackadoodle militant atheists in like the 70s and 80s that smoked a bit too much ayahuasca or something are like, you know what? This whole God thing doesn't really make sense in it. And what really kills me about that is, look, it isn't about the existence of God. Every faith-based argument is something you're never going to win against because, again, it's based on faith. I personally like to argue the merits of intelligent design, but saying that you know definitively that the God of your perception, whatever name you call him, whatever you visualize him as, that's your vision of God. That's making God in your own image. And every religion has made God in their own image. So even though I'm not a universalist by any sense, I mean, the universe is the universe either way you slice it. So assuming the human perception of an intelligent creator is at least partially correct, that, the, that life was intelligently designed, that makes so much more sense in a logical line of thought than the vast <laughs> roll of the dice that it took for life to emerge just 400 million years after the formation of our oceans. The earliest finds we have for life on Earth is even at a tentative, very liberal guess, 3.8 million years. And even taking that into account, the oceans formed 4.2 billion years ago. So already life emerged in 400 million years where it should have taken tens of billions by statistical, by current statistical models, which have not resulted in any life being created in a lab because obviously shocking pond scum will not create life. And it's clear. Why is it that abiogenesis becomes so prevalent in the modern consciousness? It's because it offers an alternative to intelligent design, point blank. They don't care about the evidence. They don't care if there's nothing to back it up. They don't care if they don't know the mechanisms. They think self-replicating RNA is enough, but RNA by itself is volatile and is non-consistent, meaning that it will quickly decay or react with other elements in its environment. So they're like, okay, well, it needs to get its, itself encapsulated or invaginated by a phospholipid bilayer. And they're like, well, we can see phospholipid bilayer spontaneously generate. Okay, cool. So now you have a phospholipid bilayer surrounding an RNA. Okay, cool. Like, what's stopping it now from, you know, get, getting getting what it needs inside of the cell? The phospholipid bilayer is impermeable to many compounds that cells need to survive, especially RNA. So you need active transport systems. Those active transport systems, surprise, surprise, either come from invaginating things in lysomes and then excreting them in the cell, which is a fairly complex process, actually, or it is a result of creating active channel proteins which will use ATP or even just concentration gradients if they're inactive to bring larger impermeable molecules across an otherwise impermeable membrane. Those things do not, of course, exist in these phospholipid bilayer bubbles. They're just bubbles. And saying that, oh, well, that's, that's a start, right? It's like, no, it's because you can't just have, it's irreductible complexity. You can't have a system in place when it's like you can only simplify life down so far before you get to something that isn't even a life form. Like in order to have a self-sustaining metabolic entity that's capable of maintaining its own existence, you need an apparatus already far more complex than whatever nature is able to just spontaneously create by itself. So even though I'm not going to go too deep into abiogenesis right now, this is going to focus more on macroevolution. 
I just want to preface that because I, I in the very beginning with Stephen Milo's video, um, he's going to come out hot the gates with this whole narrative of emerging from this pond scum, then becoming this, becoming that. And I'm going to tell you why macro evolution is not observable and testable. And I'm also going to tell you why uh, what what Anand Ra is going to say later on is also a bunch of malarkey to quote Joe Biden. Um, Aaron Ra, I keep I'm like dyslexia hitting me, but let's get into it. So the first thing I'm going to do, this preface is, of course, for those catching the stream later, because I ain't going to go back and explain all of this again. So uh, first and foremost, we're going to we're going to set this up and I'll, I'll make myself a little tiny man in the corner here. We're going to watch the first segment of Stephen Milo's video. Okay, so he said, we've been evolving for 3.7 billion years, already confirming it's a bit early. Again, a conservative estimate, a uh, very conservative estimate. That pushes life's formation here. Uh, let's actually let's actually take a gander at, um, let's see, let's just take a gander at when the oceans formed real quick. So he's claiming it's it's 3.7, whatever. I'm going to quickly look up the formation of the oceans. So what I'm getting as a result, because anybody could look this up in like five five point eight milliseconds, this is not arcane forbidden knowledge that I'm using right here. Uh, yada, yada, yada. Literally the first thing I clicked on, formation of the earth. Uh, we get it from continental shelf and very deep sea trenches, bathymetry. And it literally doesn't say that is awesome. Thank you so much, American Oceans, for wasting my time. Now we're going to Encyclopedia Britannica. It says the ocean was formed. I think a better thing to ask is liquid water on Earth. I thought this would be a quick Google search. Maybe this is arcane knowledge. You see, origin of water on Earth comes from asteroids. That's also a bunch of malarkey that I'm going to get into later. I think I've actually maybe have gotten into it. They say... Water vapor, water vapor, yada, yada, yada. Earth was hot. Water existed on Earth, so here we go. A sample of pillow basalt, a type of rock formed during the underwater eruption, was recovered from the Ishua Green Greenstone Belt, and provides in that's in Greenland, and provides uh, evidence that water exists on Earth 3.8 billion years ago. So in Canada, rocks dated 3.8 billion years ago by one study, a study I've referenced before by Cates et al. In March 2007, and then there's one that's 4.28 billion uh, years ago, and that's by uh, Jonathan O'Neill et al. Formation and metabolic history of the Nunavut Greenstone Belt. So two different uh, studies. Even if you pointed at 4.2, I mean, honestly, if we go by 3.8 million, according to that study, let's just uh, let's just bring it back because I know that people hate just like looking at um, massive screens. So if we if we bring this back and we assume that this Wikipedia article, I, I have both of these uh, sources in my tabs, but this Wikipedia article is saying that two sources say 3.8 billion years ago is the formation of water on Earth. Another says 4.28. That, that, that puts tentatively only about 100 million to 500 million years as the formation of life on Earth. Okay, so let's look at this here. It says we have been evolving for 3.7 billion years. Since life began on Earth. Okay, so right off the bat, bro, life had to emerge in perhaps as little as 100. But by the time the oceans got cool enough, and we got the, you know, densities like 400 million years after the after the oceans formed is, is the most conservative estimate. But even taking those other samples, like there's one like that one that uh, um, pointed to 4.28. I'm like, dude, if it's 3.8, then that means life had to emerge in 100 million years. So that's assuming that's just liquid water. That's just liquid water. That doesn't mean like the early oceans or anything conducive to life. But even if it is, even if that was the soup, the primordial soup and that, you know, Hadean earth that we lived in, in the Stygian seas of this Hadean earth, whatever, 
And that's where life emerged. It had to emerge in half a billion years when all the statistics, all of the probabilities, all of the cosmic dice rolls that have to occur for life to just spontaneously emerge in some pond scum would take tens of billions of years. So Stephen Miles already coming out and saying this. And see, now he just plays Animorphs. But they're not human, yeah? So he he so this is how he prefaces it. Is this march, is this typical painting of that march of life where the single cell becomes the the worm and the worm becomes the fish, and then the fish becomes the amphibian, and then the amphibian becomes the reptile, and then the reptile becomes the proto-mammal, the proto-mammal becomes the Therian mammal, and the Therian mammal becomes a proto-monkey, the proto-monkey becomes a lemur, lemur becomes fucking, you know, gib gibbon or something, you know, loses tail, walk upright, Australopithecus, homo erectus, bada bing, bada boom, your uncle Larry, or something like, it's just, I understand when people like mock you, like, oh, that's not any way how it went at all, it, it isn't one to one, but it is, because the, you're telling us that over time, these genes had shuffled to the point where animals are able to undergo radical transformations in just five to 15 million years. And what we see from generation numbers, from generation counts, I've already covered, and, and I'm going to cover again, uh, the, the differences between humans and chimpanzees. And I mentioned this in, to Clint's Reptiles too, which is why I'm, I'm starting off with Stephen Miles' critique and not Clint's, which is what kind of spawned this whole autistic rant. But what I'm trying to point out here is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary element. They require overwhelming evidence for these things to be the case. I already covered in my previous episode, and this is again, watch my previous content. I am not going to explain everything outsources. Go watch my content. I said that in the very beginning. I pointed out how in just 15 million years, you went from a fully aquatic lungfish like Eustenopteron all the way to fully terrestrial or majority terrestrial amphibians, 15 million years, 15 MFing million years. That, that's, that's nothing. That's no time whatsoever from an evolutionary standpoint. I already mentioned 15 million years. If you stretch out, like I mentioned that there's 20 million base pair differences. If you, if you split it evenly, there's 40 million base pair differences between human beings and chimpanzees splitting that evenly is 20 million. If you, Split that by the average generation time. That's 44 fixed mutations per generation that have to occur. And Clint actually responded to me and said, oh, well, what about, you know, there's there's large substitutions that can happen in the genome and large sections can attach it. I'm like, dude, almost every single one of those massive mutations that occur like that are extremely deleterious to the fitness of the organism. There's very few times where reshuffling the genome ever results well for an animal. Even if it does occur, most of the time it's just neutrally affected. Like, what's the point of consolidating a chromosome? Do chimpanzees have a fitness debuff now because they have an extra chromosome compared to humans? No. It's not the case. It's just a mutation. But without, like, showing us that, like, oh, this has an overwhelming fitness advantage, this have what it turns out to be is that we see animals perfectly crafted for a niche in the fossil record, and we just throw a huge fit. Like, Tiktaalik, perfectly adapted for its niche. It wasn't in transition between niches. It was filling a very specific niche in a very specific ecosystem. And we take that, and we run with it, and we're like, oh, this is definitive proof. But we ignore the fact that most things will never fossilize in most environments. Let's say there were, like, let's say during the age of TikTok, there were already animals on land, but they just never fossilized. That's completely possible. That's entirely within the realm of possibility. Only one to two percent of the biota of any given area will fossilize. And that's only if, that's only if you're in an area that's conducive to fossilization. Any animal that is in a tropical rainforest or in a desert environment is not going to fossilize unless it's buried by sand or a flash flood comes through or something. It's like, there's very few instances where those animals get preserved and people really don't appreciate how sparse the fossil record is. After a huge span of time, we start to see ourselves in the fossils. So he's going to go over six million years ago, our ancestors hominins split from a ancestor with the chimpanzees. So, Again, I've pointed out how that just does not work out mathematically. And as, as to prove my point, I'm going to go to the next video 
and comprehensively talk about this guy. Because this guy, I think, is the... I think I kind of honestly like and respect both Clint and Steven, if I'm being perfectly honest, just as scientists. I like their content. It's very sleek. It's very clean. I've been subscribed to both for a while. I'm not subscribed to this guy, and you're about to see why. Um, again, his intro is extremely annoying. Okay, so this guy immediately comes out the gates with a, with a bunch of hot bullshit. And this is why I don't like him, because he immediately hits you with the dogma full force and feels like he, again, he's going to go on his little, uh, his little rant here. But let, let's see what uh, Aaron Ra has to say. Because we have to have a little bit of comic relief, yeah? Okay, so he said, the study of genetic has inferred and informed much we know about our, our evolution. Has it now, sir? I just pointed out how many fixed mutations, and fixed means that it occurs in every single member of the population. How many fixed mutations would happen to occur on average per generation in order to get a human being or a chimpanzee out of a common ancestor of both? And, and human beings are much more altered from the base. So, th so much more of this is probably happening. But let's say it's split right down the middle based on base mammalian mutation rates, which I'm about to show you in Popchin. L like, I, I, like, I'm going to let you cook, sir. But genomics absolutely does not, does not reinforce what you say about evolution, especially in the realms of abiogenesis and this rapid change in five to 10, 15 million years time spans, which is what we're seeing. Because they're like, oh, well, it's like this has happened 53 million years ago. And that's how long it took to diverge between these. No, it's like a lot of times, like the difference between Pachycetus and Bacillosaurus, 5 million years. So in the amount of time it took human beings to diverge from chimpanzees, a hoofed, artiodactyl sheep relative became a fully aquatic, 20 foot long cetacean. It, be it became a whale in less time. Then it took a, a border, a, a, an omnivorous sheep, a, a sea pig, a, a river, a river swine. It is like a warthog becoming a, a beaked whale, bro. It is like it's like a warthog becoming a dolphin. In less time, it took than bison and cattle to diverge. That that is literally what these guys are telling us. What in the hell genomics are you talking about? Do you know the number of you can't even bootstrap them with an artiodactyla above a seventy percent? random resampling rate the bootstrap between dogs and bears being related is like 99 percent, 90 percent. it's in the 90th percentile it, it, the, the bootstrap to put gorillas gorillas in the in the hominids and stuff you could do this with the monkeys it's it's actually a bit lower you're putting humans actually in with hominids is a bit anomalous because we have many genetic differences between even our closest relatives like i mentioned the difference in chromosome number and various other more um molecular and morphological differences that scientists overlook to you know anthropomorphize the animal which is a trend in science in general anthropomorphize oh look at their faces look at their hands i'm like okay look at their reproductive cycle look at their bone density look at their shoulder and hip morphology you know i could go down the list even looking at their brains human beings brains are on just another level compared to any other animal on earth it's like it doesn't even resemble other animal brains but still it's like you have this guy saying oh well the science the science but I'm like, source, sir. You know, it's my turn to actually turn around and say source this, source that. Because when I look at your sources, they're usually bunk. They usually don't hold water because your sources never adequately go. It's like if, if what I do on my channel is something anybody could do in their free time. There's nothing I'm doing that's that groundbreaking. I'm just actually deciding to break the mold and buck the trend. So let's go and say if you trace your genetic ancestry or take a paternity test, Except, of course, it reaches much further back. Okay, so I, if you do, you go to one human being, you go to one man and one woman that existed in the tune of 225,000 years ago. You have Y chromosome, Adam, a mitochondrial uh, DNA, Eve. It traces back to exactly two people, which you could say reinforces a biblical narrative, whatever, whatever, but we know the earliest human beings that contributed to modern humanity. All other human beings are like, oh, well, they may have interbred and da 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 da, -da with them and da, da da I'm like, fair point, whatever. There might have been earlier humans. But these two human beings, if we do wind back the clock, only go back 225,000 years. We have no genetic connection to these earlier hominids. So first and foremost, that's what the science 
actually says, when you trace back our genomes, you only go back 225,000 years. You don't go back 6 million years. You don't. You go back 225,000 years. So immediately, my man's coming at you with some hot baloney. So I'm going to go further and let him cook a bit. Mm-hmm. So far. Yep, always confirms an evolutionary phylogeny, biological relationship with every other animal and a growing network of them. And more than that, when you feed all these into data points into a computer, it resolves a taxonomic hierarchy or a family tree showing which ones are more closely related and how. Okay, so do in the realm of morphology, when you know that most animals will converge on very specific body planes because of the gravity of our planet, because of the laws of physics, it's only natural that they're going to have similar formatting. If life is intelligently designed, then of course, most animals would have the ba same basic formatting. Does that prove that they magically transformed into one another or that they're especially closely related because we, they share bilateral symmetry? Or is it entirely possible that they converge on these same genetic structures even if by your random evolutionary, macroevolutionary, whatever, you, if you can have convergences in morphology, why can't you have convergences in genetics? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. The same code can become upon twice, yeah? So why is it that we all have to descend from a bilaterian common ancestor? We already see in nature that unrelated lineages can come upon the same morphologies. Oftentimes those morphologies will take different genetic pathways, but what if they don't? What if the same Hox genes, what if the same regulatory genes to give an animal bilateral symmetry and two arms and two legs, gills, whatever breathing apparatus, neuro neurological tissue, et cetera, is common ground and that there's only a few ways to actually crack this egg or skin that cat? In that case, your entire argument falls apart. It doesn't prove a family tree of relatedness. It proves a baseline template that life uses in order to be functional on Earth. And that outside of these templates, it's either too energetically complex or really just too impractical to come upon other ways of doing this. What if there is only a couple ways to actually get this result on the genetic level? Then you would have to, by necessity, have these genes in the way they are. And if they are based on mutation, what's to say they did not all converge upon the same exact genomic architecture? That in and of itself is the rub. You claim this radical genetic mutation can occur at extremely rapid rates over short amounts of time. And what's to say there are not convergences in the genome, just like there are convergences in morphology. If convergence is a major aspect of evolution, which I always say convergences for thee, but not for me, whatever fits my theory, that's totally a point where they're related. If it doesn't fit my theory, then it's convergent evolution, toss it in the trash. And it's something I see over and over again. You cherry pick the fossil record, you fit your cherry pick genomes. And even when the results are non-conclusive, like I mentioned, placing whales with an artiodactyla, you still, you still want to go in and be like, oh, oh, it's my ankle morphology. Oh, my molecular stuff. It's the closest to them molecularly. But our infantile knowledge of DNA is so shallow. How are you going to say that this organism is definitively shape-shifted from this other organism over a few million years, almost deceptively low amounts of million, millions of years, and sit there with a straight face and do it. I can believe, man, like my microevolution makes sense. I can believe that all equus came from Eohippus. That a tiny ass horse can become a bunch of big horses is not a shock to me. Chihuahuas and Great Danes are related. I believe in change within a kind. Microevolution is observable and testable. We know that animals will radiate within their species and families. I can believe that at one time a small deer became all the deer. I can believe that one cat became all the cats or one dog became all the dogs. One bear became all the bears. That's not, that's not a shocker to me. I, I can see that phylogeny. But what I don't buy is this idea that just because animals come upon very universal frameworks for their DNA architecture, that they're all somehow related now. That doesn't vibe with me. And it doesn't vibe with me because there's only a few ways to skin this genetic cat. I'm going to let him go on. Oh, here's his, here's his fancy trees. But the DNA of a few thousand species. So he calculates phylogenetic relationship, but also date the nodes and the points of divergence in that tree by matching radiometric dates of associated fossil. Okay, so you cherry picking the fossil record and then evaluates the molecular clock, the average mutation rates 
And those results have been consistent, effectively confirming paleontology, except they're not. Because what you're actually seeing from this is this. I'm going to show you something called POPGEN. Now, the actual base mutation rate of mammals is said to be 2.2 times 10 to the negative 9 per base mutation rates per year. So winding back that clock, that's how we got to this whole thing with the chimpanzees, yeah? And this is a paper by, okay, Sudhir um, Kumar and Suprahamya, whatever their names are. And they basically looked at mutations of vital importance. I highly recommend going through this paper. It is non-biased. It is just straight up to the facts. And we can see this, even covering some controversy. So the average mammalian genome mutation rate is 2.2 times 10 to the 9 power. I plug that right into Popgen over here. So as you can see, when I come over here, um, I show the A2 to A1 mutation rate. That shows um, at a single loci for a Mendelian trait. This is an A1A2 for a Mendelian gene. One of the most simple forms of mutation you can have. It's not uh, polygenic, needing multiple genes to be expressed, which is another bag of worms, because how are you getting all those genes for every poly polygenic gene in the uh, a uh, gene in the genome, you need all those genes. There's an irreductible complexity. You need all those genes to make it work or to maximize fitness. And until you have all those genes in place, it basically won't do anything or it'll have a very minor effect on fitness, which we're about to calculate. Because as you're about to see with W, calculating fitness is how many more babies you have. So if you have three out of five genes for a polygenic trait for, let's say, speed, and only makes you a tiny bit faster, there's a lot of luck, a lot of other things that can get in the way even at the most optimistic scale, you might have slightly more kids. You might get lucky on a bunch more kids. But an entire population of you, the fitness advantage for a single mutation is not usually going to be extremely drastic, except in the very, very rare handful of circumstances. And we clearly see looking at the genome that this isn't the case. A lot of the genes are neutral. A lot of the genes differences between human beings and chimpanzees, for example, uh, are junk DNA or uh, there are alterations to the genome in areas that are non-coding. So there's other areas where it's reached, reached fixation, but it confers no fitness advantage. And so I'm about to BTFO him literally right here and this paper by showing you a very, very simple exercise. Uh, this exercise is, oh, what's up, David? Yes, I'm alive. And so is my internet. I'm finally, we got the upgraded Wi-Fi, man. We got that Starlink. Thank you, Elon Musk. Starship's going great. So, um, but here we go. I'm about to, I'm about to show you why he's wrong. So he says, basically in a nutshell, that this paper proves by turning back the molecular clock on average mutation rates, that it could basically confirms paleontology and the timelines. So he's so, showing that within 5 million years, this is 60, 50 million years, that Proboscis, Dias, Irene, and Hyracodia all diverged, began to be different. This shows their... Uh, the, the bootstrap ratio I'm guessing is that X factor. I want to see this graph because he just, he shows the paper, but once you actually look at this paper, so what these show is the bootstrap ratios and genetic distances. I'm, I'm guessing this is what, the, what it's bootstrapped at. That's random resampling data. These values, if they are bootstrap ratios are very low. Um, a 67% confidence interval. You want this at like 90s, bro. This needs to be in like the 90th percentile to be even remotely conclusive. If this is what I think it is. So I don't know what this paper is doing, but even if I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt, okay? Giving it the benefit of the doubt. I'm about to show you PopGen. So we, I plug in the base mutation rate of mammals. That's 2.2 times 10 to the ninth power for a Mendelian trait calculating fitness, which is the difference in offspring between two different uh, beings within this generation. And so I'm plugging that in. So here's the base mutation rate of mammals. I've shown this demonstration before. There are no individuals with this allele. I'm plugging into a, popula a healthy population of, let's say, 10,000 individuals. There's a minute fitness advantage to, being, to having one copy of the A1, A2. Some genes, there won't be any. You have to have both. But let's just say, for the sake of this, and then for this one, you get 0.8. So this gene is, let's see, 0.2 over the 8. Let's say 25% more effective. So there's a 25% uh, average number more of offspring for uh, those who have this trait. So if I'm having like, what, four baby, uh, if, if one without it will have four babies, 
then a pro early proboscidean or early hominid with this gene will have on average four. Okay. And it might be something that makes you a little bit taller, a little bit faster, a little bit stronger, you know, so general increase of fitness. Once we actually look at this curve. Okay. So in most of these populations, you can see that with a slight fitness advantage, something that gives you a little bit of a boost from one gene, which is normally what we see in nature, if it does anything at all, let's say there's a source sink. Uh, let's actually not mess with migration, actually. So let's say this is a thing. And every all the entire populations in one area, we're calculating, uh, there's five different populations, 500 generations, and there's 10,000 individuals. We press go, and it calculates that it will take, in order to reach fixation, because that's what I'm talking about, when the differences between human beings and chimps, that 20 million base pair difference uh, between the two takes 44 average mutations per generation to reach fixation. We're looking at similar values over here in the evolution of elephants, looking at Rodentia, looking at all these uh, different lineages that split off in just a few million years from one another. And when you actually go and you calculate based on that base mutation rate, it's taken somewhere in the realm of bada bing, bada boom. So it takes around 300 generations to reach fixation. You're already basically 90% of the way there in 170 some odd generations though. But it takes 170 generations. So for one gene that, that boosts your population, you boost your average clutch size by 25%, one mutation, that is incredible yield. That is a huge return on investment. That is a huge yield, man. Case selecting species otherwise. It takes this many generations. And I told you that the generation length of chimpanzees and humans is even at the most gener generous estimate between averaging male and females, time of reproduction, 15 years. Still, even if saying like, oh, well, big changes in the genome happened, it wasn't just this, there's pleiotropic traits that balance out the polygenic traits. Cool. Even then, and this is an argument I made with Clint's reptiles, even then, the number of mutations that have to occur and the time it takes for it to reach fixation make this impractical. It makes it impractical. It took, it took, it took nearly 200 generations for a clearly advantageous trait, one that is even has a, a fitness benefit if you just have one copy of the gene and it still took this long. It, let's say it just like you have to have both and we calculate it again. The gene barely even makes it out of the gate. As you can see here, without this advantage, if the gene only confers a massive benefit, if it's homozygous, if there's two copies of it, dude, the gene, the population's finite, but it doesn't, it doesn't even go anywhere. Again, if it doesn't for a slight advantage, then we get this wave. And if we go like this, if it's a if it's a minor gene, half of that, look at look how long it takes for this gene to reach fixation. It takes in the realm of 200 generations for a gene that's only minorly affecting minorly affecting the generation to reach fixation. What about all the genes that are neutral? It would, it would take eons for that to reach fixation. And yet these guys are claiming that whales, like let's, let's go back here, talk about, you know, oh, but if it's like, you look in here, it's like, it's talking about whales becoming, it's like the, these, these basically these stem pigs, these stem sheep becoming whales in 5 million years, fully aquatic, fully aquatic lungfish becoming fully terrestrial amphibians in 15 million years. Human, uh, chimpanzee, you know, chimpanzee looking guys becoming human beings in 6 million years. And you're saying this confirms it? When, when every single model I've ever done looking at mutation rates shows that the base mutation rate of animals is incredibly low. This level of mutation rate, it's like this, does, this gene doesn't even show up in the population really. In an infinite population, this is what you get. But as you can clearly see, in these finite populations, it doesn't even happen.
This is the probability of mutation. In an infinite population, it takes over 200, uh, 200 years for this to occur. I could, I could keep pumping this up. Might crash my stream with that big of a number, I just realized. Oh man, it did it. And still, again, the mutation rate is so low, you don't really get anything. So, in a population of 5,000 animals, say in a population of 5,000 animals, you won't even have that mutation occur. The base mutation rate of mammals is so low that this mutation rate won't even occur, guys. Won't even occur in 500 generations. People don't understand that the main mechanism of evolution is not, is not natural selection. It is not the environmental pressures. It is not random luck or chance. It is mutation. The base mutation rate tells all there is no evolution without mutation. According to modern science, it is. But there is no, there's no change, there's no alteration, there's no phenotypic whatever. None of it. It all, it all relies upon the base mutation rate. So looking at an infinite population, this might occur in so and so generations. Oh, we know the mutations occur, but how many layers, how many mutations are supposed to get? The base mutation rate of mammals is so damn low that the average number of mutations that are required for all of these animals to go through their rapid transformations is hilariously astronomical. He's the Aaron Ra is a complete and utter idiot. I'm sorry. He's the only guy here. Like I respect Clint. This guy is a goofball. F tier channel, bro. This guy is a goofball. And if he wants to come after you, like, oh, well, you're just a da 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 da. I'm like, bro, I'm not over here spewing straight up BS. We know the base mutation rate of mammals, and it is not even remotely, not even remotely confirming paleontology at all. Sup, Emmanuel, coming back at you. So, where Aaron Ra is wrong is that paleontology does not actually prove any of this. When we actually check the data, when we actually use a model that shows these things go to go, not only does the mutation not even show up in a population this small with 10,000 individuals, but even in an infinite population, it takes look how long it takes to reach actual fixation. It doesn't even reach true fixation within this within 500 generations. It's close. But there are 20 million fixed gene different fixed genes in our genome, base pairs. So, how many genes are in those base pairs? Human beings have around 10,000 genes, all right? But look how long it takes for a single gene to even emerge through mutation when your mutation rate is 2.2 times 10 to the ninth power, and then see how long it takes for that gene to reach fixation within a population with this level of benefit. And like I said, even if I boost this, completely boost this to where you have 25% more offspring if you have this gene, even if you just have one gene, look how long it still takes for an infinite population to not only mutate this gene, but then to have it reach fixation in the population. Again, another 100 generations. Whereas these niggas are out here telling us that there's our average 44 mutations per generation between human beings and chimps, which Stephen Milo corroborates, which Aaron Ra corroborates, with, which Clint's Reptiles corroborates, and these all go on. So the main guy, the main dude I wanted to get to is Clint. That's why I've saved him for last. And I have no interest watching any more of this garbage from Aaron. So again... Like, this is something I keep ragging on and on about. People in the comments being like, source, source, I need a source for that, sir, source. And I show them. Like, I go onto my channel, and I click this stuff into PopGen, and I show them, like, exactly what's what's up. And they just, they scoff. They don't, they do, they're like, oh, well, that's overly simplistic. I'm like, is it? I'm being extremely generous. What genes offer a 25% fitness bonus off of one gene mutation? Most, again, most of the base pair differences between human beings and chimps are in junk DNA. 
those genes are either they're pseudo genes that offered you know less and less benefit in human beings over time or they're junk dna base pairs that never ended up in a, in a gening part of the in the of the genome and they're saying oh well it could have happened from one massive event of transfer i'm like dude give me a break clint and so i actually had a straight up conversation with clint um concerning this video so i'm gonna get right into it and break this down with with a Walmart shotgun it is dug out so this, so Clint's purpose of this video is to debunk um, creationist arguments. So Clint himself claims to be religious, but he's going to be uh, reacting to creationist arguments. And again, these are some of the most smooth brain, low IQ creationist arguments ever. I can match you with why I think intelligent design is the way to go. And I'm pulling up stuff like pop gin, then I'm pulling out, you know, papers reinforcing my argument that are non-biased i'm pulling out it's radford.edu and encyclopedia britannica to show you from your own sources why you're wrong and they don't want any part of me again i'm some whoologist they don't care but one thing that irritates the shit out of me is when people are disingenuous like this 44 changes on the animorphs <laughs> tyrannid mutation rates Turtle and the egg. Yes. How many genes do you need to mutate to make an egg? I'm glad, Emmanuel, that you remember this. This is something that I also wanted to present to Clint. The turtle and the egg. So I showed you guys a while back. I'll show you like uh, the egg-laying organs of a turtle. And I showed you how the turtles being anapsids and they're saying they're diapsids, throws a whole wrench into the idea that turtles for some reason, like turtles for some reason, they're they're also diapsids. But they're anapsids. So like, does that mean that now all synapsids are not related to us then? So I'm about to blow y'all's mind real quick. How many times, how many mutations do you have to get I'm about to show you all this JPEG because some of these are maybe not safe for work. I don't, I don't know, but I'm about to show you all this JPEG. So here is the egg laying apparatus of a chicken, for example, and it's very similar across all Archosauria. How many genes do you need to mutate to be able to get to the egg? How many genes does the turtle need to mutate to get to the egg? It's, it's like the, it is, it is almost like these mofos when confronted with the most obvious aspects of science, don't actually understand how ludicrous and extraordinary their claims actually are. They, they think it's a no brainer, but just like I've shown multiple times in the past, just how crazy and ridiculous it is to say, oh, in 5 million years, the, the same guys who think that a pig can become a, a whale in less time it takes for a human being and a chimp to, to diverge, or less time than cattle and bison to diverge. These same people will sit here and call you an ignoramus for believing in an other argument. So he's going to be reacting to a bunch of these very smooth brain, seemingly smooth brain arguments. So cherry picking the fossil record is something scientists often do, and I think it's really funny how he basically is going to take other people cherry picking the fossil record and critique him with no self-awareness. Okay, so what, what, are the, what are the some of the arguments of changing a dinosaur into a bird? First and foremost, the foot morphology between most dinosaurs, including theropod dinosaurs and birds, is different. Birds have a 2-3-4 um, foot morphology, and that's kind of what spawned the Thicodon hypothesis. Dinosaurs have a 1-2-3. Uh, so already off the bat, we don't see birds using the same fingers or, or the same digits in the same ways. Uh, there's a myriad of other differences, such as the pigeon style, the fused finger digits, things of that nature that differentiate the bird. The hip morphology of a bird uh, does not resemble theropod morphology. They cope by oh, cope with this by saying, oh, well, ornithischian hip morphology literally just means bird-like hip. 
So if birds are theropods, why do they have ornithischian hips? They're like, oh, well, it just convergently looks like that. If you look at the pupus and how it's arranged in the, in the archaeopteryx, then it, it's like, well, archaeopteryx is not a crown bird, so it doesn't count, nigga. You can't, you can't just be like, oh, well, this thing that looks like this thing but isn't this thing is why this thing is this thing. That's not how this works in science, brah. You can't look at a animal with convergences like a thylacine and see like, oh, because the thylacine has a fox-like head structure, the wolf um the wolf developed this head-like structure because it does the same thing like no it's it convergence it doesn't have anything to do with one or the other so pointing at other theropods and being like oh this is why birds have this and birds have that it's not related it's not related you can't see a gorilla peel a banana and be like oh that's why human beings peel bananas because gorillas peel bananas gorillas have nothing to do with humans thylacines have nothing to do with foxes or wolves it's a convergence in morphology but these guys will look at the fossil record and be like, oh, well, this is an Archaeopteryx. has all these features that are not bird-like. It has teeth. It has claws. It has a tail. But it's a bird, guys, because it, can, it has feathers. If that ain't the most retarded shit I've ever heard in my life, it's like seeing an animal that looks like another animal and then immediately going, oh, it's the ancestor. Oh, go. And then finding out that there's like contemporary animals that look much more like modern birds and Archaeopteryx that all three lineages of the modern birds emerged before the late Cretaceous. It's like scientists have been like constantly moving goalposts when they assert like, oh yeah, after the KT mass extinction event, all the bird lineages emerged and they evolved. I'm like, oh, then it turns out that Paleogonathes, Galloanserae and Neoaves and other Neornithines were actually present in the Cretaceous. Oh, my bad guys. So anyway, and yeah, they do not want the smoke. They don't. They'll go after these guys who were like low, low IQ, like relatively uneducated guys making the most basic creationist arguments because that's all they can go after. They don't want to hear about evolution, nigga. They don't want. They don't want to hear the the forty four mutation gospel. It, it's a, it's it's rough out here in these streets for these guys, man. It's like they're confronted with actual holes in their theories. No man, no way, Jose. They're not going to actually confront that. So he talks about evolution, his credentials, why you should listen to him. I had I I got a degree from a from a from a school that indoctrinated me for twelve years straight. Uh, so m not to mock or ridicule, but taking the most basic ass arguments, yada yada. Actually think so. He's trying to see well how we actually think. If you didn't catch that, he just said, you know, I'm doing this not to mock or ridicule because I want to know what they actually think. So he's doing this out of the good graces of his own heart, but is simultaneously trying to ignore the mediest. And, and harshest critiques of his own argument, which is why I obviously flame the comments. I'm, I would actually be shocked as hell if my comments are actually still. Here we go. So actually, my comments are still here. And I had another more uh, fruitful exchange in another comment, but I basically said this. I might try to find that, that other comment that I had because he actually responded to a few things. And I actually did want to respond to that while getting into this. Um, so if I can... Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly look through his channel. I need to see which one it is. Corvid, Corvid, Corvid. Gorillas are monkey. Is it this one from a month ago? It's the one in my history. Might be this one. Aha, it is this one. Okay, so this is kind of what I covered. This is why this is coming full circle. So he talks about gorillas are monkeys and so are you. You can't evolve out of a clade. The fucking irony, guys, of him saying this right in the title, knowing what the science says, and then still standing behind his, you know, fish becomes a lizard hypotheses. You can't evolve out of a clade because only like comes from like. Only life begets life. Only similar forms lead to other similar forms. You don't get magical shape-shifting animals. That's not what we see in nature. We don't see radical changes in the genome every generation. We do not see that. The base mutation rate in animals is so damn low that unless you have an infinite population, statistically speaking, it'll take you thousands of generations to come up with even one spontaneous mutation. That's hardcore. That's what, that's what the science shows. Anatomic and modern humans have been around for... Over a quarter of a million years, guys. Have we evolved in a bit? No. We we have we have some people who like have you know slanty eyes and big noses and really curly hair and dark skin, light skin. 
dark-skinned, light-skinned, Asian, and white women. You know, as, as to as to quote the modern poets and philosophers, that's what we got after after a quarter of a million years. We don't got niggas walking around with horns and flippers. No, that's not what we see. Human beings in if you quadruple that time, maybe you'd have enough fixed pair base differences. You know, it's already at the point now where even even human beings. North American gray wolves and coyotes are about as genetically divergent as Scandinavians and Bantu Africans. Still reproduce produce fertile offspring. The idea of what a species is is a completely artificial construct anyway. But here I'm just going in because I'm responding to his literal, I'm to his literal defense. And again, he points out someone, one of the people in this actually did critique him too. One of the people on his defense actually did critique him. And so like he, um, Already somebody spoke out against this because it's so presumptuous. And here's what I said. The primate base mutation rates are literally not fast enough for humans and chimps to share a common ancestor even 9 million years ago. There are 40 million base. And this 9 is like the early. That's like super early. Most people are saying. Most people are saying 6. There's no sound, by the way. Yeah. So I purposefully, as long as I have sound and cool, I don't play audio of videos because of copyright. YouTube is cringe and blue pilled and radically homosexual and does not take kindly to me playing audio. It does not like it. It's never liked it. Even a StreamYard, it's like I'm glad that StreamYard has it off by default because I learned that with TikTok. Like, remember that that video that got struck where I'm like, oh yeah, well, let's play the audio. Bruh. Edwin played that audio. That shit got copyright struck in the instance. So I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of done with the, with the audio playing. So I am just putting on captions and kind of seeing what's happening, but I just want to respond to like what I said. So I said, again, the primate based mutation rates are literally not fast enough for humans and chimps to share a common ancestor, even 9 million years ago. So the consensus is six, but I'm being very conservative guys. I always give them so much slack when I don't have to. If there are 40 million base pair differences between us, if we divide that 20 million human mutations by 450,000 generations, assuming a generation of 18 years, by the way, since the last common ancestor, that would mean there would be an average of 44 fixed mutations per generation. That's assuming 9 million years, by the way, not even six. So clearly isn't the case that observing modern humans and apes, so what gives? Models of genomic molecular evolution do not uh, correlate whatsoever with proposals of macroevolutionary shape-shifting currently being thrown out in academia. Upon finishing my zoology degree, I'm not sure if I'm eager to go back, only to have the same non-scientific borderline cultish dogma forced down my throat again. And he responded, if there are 40 million unconnected differences or a total of 40 million base pairs that are different, some individual genes are millions of base pairs long. One single gene duplication, deletion, inversion can hold a large kind of that difference. I said, and okay, this is a point. But again, guys, look how long it took. Look how long it took. For a single allele, maybe just a couple of the base mutation rate. And first and foremost, it never even showed up in the finite populations. And it took 20, 20 generations. 20 generations, and you're not even at a third of the population. In a gene that increases your fitness by 25%. And the longer the base pair differences, the less likely the change is going to occur. The math compounds. Every single aspect of the gene that changes increases the likelihood that it will never occur in the first place. The more radical the change of the gene, the more dangerous it is for the organism, because now you don't know if this one change is going to result in cancer or you becoming Superman. So that's a risk. Most gene uh, mutations are either neutral or actively deleterious, which is why your body has multiple redundancies in preventing it, because turns out the same genes that prevent mutation are the same genes that fight cancers. That in large, that in animals that are trying really hard to not have cancer, turns out they have a lot of DNA repair mechanisms, many of whom specifically deal with repairing mutation damage. So mutation, first and foremost, is not something selected for in animals. You would think if mutation was such a positive force, the more animals would select for it, and that's not true. Turns out, fucking with your baseline architecture genomically is not a good idea, and most animals have very low mutation rates. I'm talking astronomical. Look how small this number is. 
A mutation not only has to happen in your body, it has to happen in your germ cell. That germ cell has to be the one that fertilizes the egg. This is why the scientific probability of this is so low, because even for that mutation to occur is fucking miraculous. But now that sperm, that gamete, without any of the positive selection pressures of that gene, has to somehow beat all of these other gametes. I mean, it's like, dude, you're, you're compounding things so much. Not only does a miracle have to happen on the genomic level, but also a mistake in coding. Now a completely other random process that's unrelated to that mutation has to deliver that mutation to another gamete. Fertilize it, bada bing, bada boom. Even in asexually reproducing organisms, it takes for ages. It takes ages for a population to actually meaningfully see this. And I'm working with numbers that are generous. A 25% fitness boost from a single gene is incredible. Most of the time, genes, mutations will not result in that. Even if an animal is more cryptically colored, it won't really result. That's usually a microevolutionary thing anyway. But even with something like that, where it's like the, the you know, the pet, the, what was it? The, the pepper moth or whatever, like the white, like there was very heavy selection pressure for one to change or the other. Or I know about monarch butterflies where the number of white butterflies in Hawaii increased to seven and a half percent. Uh, because the the orange ones are being eaten by bulbuls and potentially other predators. So it's like microevolutionarily, you can see things change very quickly in terms of allele frequency. But remember, it's just allele frequency. There was no white mutation that's miraculously occurred in Hawaii. There were already white monarch butterflies, just as there were already white and black pepper moths. Many things that people ascribe to mutations have been there in the human genome the whole time. Or they're in animal genomes the whole time. They're just alleles that have not reached fixation because their fitness it, fitness levels are negligible. If we start out with allele frequency of like 0. 0.5, if we start off with these allele frequencies, and let's say like half the population has this. Let's say it's a 0. 0.5. So half the population has this allele, and it confers the barest barest minimum in terms of benefits, but you have a slight mutation rate. Look how effing long it takes to reach fixation in generation. When, when we bust it out to the big scale, get bigger and bigger, my guy, this gene based on the human muta like base mutation rate, already half the population has it. it. It is actively mutating, actively changing. Let's Let's take that and let's put that back to zero. Let's place that back to zero. Let's generate it again. Okay. So now we see over and over, it takes in all populations to reach fixation. It'll take, ooh, still not fixed after 500 generations. Wow. We, so even when this thing's, so let's say it's even lower. Let's say this mutation somehow occurs in, that's the thousands place. That's the tens of thousands place. Let's say just one dude has it. Nope. Completely dies off. Actually, I think I added one too many zeros. Uh, nope. Also dies off. Uh, let's let's go down more zeros. Okay. Now, now it's starting to creak up there. But look. With population like frequency, like this is allele frequency, uh, that was 0. 0.5. Let's say it happens in one percent of the population has this mutation. Go look how long it takes to even reach an allele frequency of 70 percent with the gene that offers a pretty, a pretty substant, a pretty you know, negligible change, but still one that is meaningful. It shows that you're you have about one percent more offspring. You know we can make it a bit better. Make it five percent. Let's make it uh, seven five here, and let's make it ninety five there. Oh, now here we go. See the fitness has now increased to such where in most populations it's taking around three hundred generations to reach fixation in a gene that is obviously beneficial and occurs in. believe yeah 
this amount of the population. So 1% of 10,000, which would be 100. So 100 individuals have the gene in a population of 10,000, and it takes 300 generations to reach fixation in most, not even 300, to almost reach fixation above the 80th percentile in all pops after 325. Do you see what this implies? Do you see what do you see what this implies? Let's let's just say that let's say zero two. Let's go back to our same base mutation rate. So the mutation will keep occurring. Let's just say same fitness. My my goodness! Look how long this takes. Look how long this takes from just a single pair of individuals. <laughs> from just like twenty individuals out of ten thousand. In a population this small with that many individuals with this gene that is still beneficial where, you know, if you have this, you're 10% more reproductively capable than all these other guys. So a modestly decent gene mutation, just one gene, but gives you a very healthy boost to your population. Man, that thing's going to reach fixation with the quickness. 500 generations. And we're talking with 250,000. So actually, this gene is very, very good. It'll reach fixation lickety split. But if we're looking at and talking about base mutation differences, guys, then that's not going to fucking cut it. That's not going to cut it. In 450,000 generations, that's 44 base pair mutation differences per generation. And we're nowhere close to that. We're nowhere close to that when we look at PopGen. Look how it takes 500 generations for this to reach fixation. And we're not even at absolute fixation. There's still many, many individuals, at least a handful of individuals, that will keep floating around with these A2 genes in perpetuity. Those will stay in the baseline of the, of the gene pool, waiting their turn. And because of the aspects of genetic drift, even neutral mutations will reach fixation, but only after millions of years. So I said and responded, indeed, but reaching fixation within the entire population that quickly, I understand we've gone through a bottleneck 75,000 years ago, but the current estimates for human chimp divergence make no sense given how modern population genetics play out. For example, the genes for lactose tolerance and gluten digestion have an even rich fixation of modern human populations, despite being in the gene pool for hundreds of generations and having clear positive selection. The disconnect between genomic mutation rate and modern conjecture around human origin is a glaring hole in ape origin hypothesis. Clearly something deeper is going on here. We have to yet to see the full picture. He says, we're not talking about millions of unrelated base pair changes reaching fixation, but we are, because most of these base pairs are not in coding parts of the genome, Clint. Most of these are actually happening in junk DNA or in certain regulatory genes here and there's inconsequential areas, and they're still reaching the fixation. These number of base pairs reaching fixation per generation is not tenable. That means massive genomic restructuring had to take place, like, for example, losing a gene compared to chimps. It's like we have 46 we have 46 chromosomes compared to chimps 48. A massive change in chromosome. You change a chromosome in a modern human, you get, uh, uh. You do not get like super fucking like Aryan Chad. You get, hello. You know, you get a free parking spot for life. That's what you get with an extra chromosome. If you lose a chromosome, gain a chromosome, the only thing you're going to get is a parking lot space. All right. All you're going to get is a blue tag on your, on your, on your license plate at the very best. Trillion shot and a big rock kills that animal. Exactly. Probability. Th the mutation only happens in one individual. One individual. This is this is why even with Popgen, it's very misleading because it all begins with one. You don't get a nice big batch of 10. It's like maybe if they're all identical twins and the mutation happened in the germ and the it's like an armadillo or something and the mutation, you know, that it starts as one embryo and then it splits off at all the other embryos maybe, but that's not how most animals sexually produce. In fact, animals can have different fathers even. So it's like, you're not going to get the same genes in every sibling. You're not, you might even not pick up the mutation. The mutation may, might come from the mother, but it might pick up that father's, that father's part of the genome from, you know, from the, from the, from the crossing that happens during metaphase. So the intercross that happens during metaphase may not even pick up that gene. You might have a brother with blue eyes. You might have brown eyes, you know, different hair, different, different height, different skin complexion, all because you're inheriting different chunks and bits of each gamete's DNA during the process of meiosis, each gamete, it's all the same DNA, yeah, but it does end up with different mirrors to the gene. So if you're heterozygous, let's say you have an A1, 
Let's say your dad has an A1A1, your mom's an A1A2, pun and square that shit, 25% chance one of you is going to have that A2 gene. They're talking as if they're cloned. Wow, it's almost like we were created, but no, these scientists think we're a very big brain. This, this is what's so frustrating talking to guys like Clint because it's like, it's clear, bro. It's clear. If you look at the math, look at the math. Don't look at fucking fossils. Don't look at any of this like pretty fucking graphs and shit. It's just like with these climate change niggas in their graphs, bro. It's like that, that infamous meme where it's like, oh, and here's one that conservatives love to look at. It's this graph like showing crime going down because they're not prosecuting cases. It's the same shit. In science, it's like, oh, look how related they are, guys, because we have no actual reference point for anything. It's like, okay, dude, how show me the show me the whole facts, show me the genome, show me the reproductive capacity. Show, is it our case selecting? These things all matter because when I actually go and I simulate this shit, when I pop in the base mutation rate, average base mutation rate of mammals into something that can simulate this when i plug in this base mutation rate i go to there are no niggas here in a population of a hundred thousand animals and a 10 percent increase in fitness from this one gene bada bing let's go after 500 fucking generations bruh look at that shit Look at it. And that's an infinite pop. And none of these, gener first and foremost, in 500 years, 500 generations is not enough for this mutation to occur anywhere. Nobody making it out of the hood with this one. In an infinite population, let's say there's millions of these animals, 500 million years, you barely get to 5% of the, of the entire population. I could pop this up to 1,000 generations. Calculate this again. Oh, Population three mutated the gene. We got we got our magic number. So one population out of five mutated the gene. It then took after it first mutated. Here's the population. So first muta mutated here, generation like 620, 630. So 620-ish. And then it took another 400 years to reach the 70th percentile, 75th percentile. It's on its way to fixation. I could probably go 1,200 generations. It didn't even show up again. Let's, let's try it again. I'm going to keep doing this until it randomly mutates, guys. Come on, let's, let's roll those dice. Let's roll those creationist dice. Come on, randomness. Come on, chaos. Come on, base mutation rate of mammals. Come on, this gene has to pop up sometime, guys. If I, if I try enough times, it'll pop up. Come on, none of the, none of the populations are mutating, guys. Where's my shape-shifting animals? Where are my shape-shifting animals? Come on, guys. Like, Come on, root for me, guys. You're not a gene scientist? Come on, Emmanuel. Where's where's your fancy degree? Where's your PhD, bro? You have no PhD, bro? All right, all right. I'm rolling, guys. I'm rolling, guys. Roll, roll again. Come on. This 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 gene has to randomly mutate sometime. All right, this time it'll randomly mutate. Oh, and keep in mind, um, 1,200 generations are passing every time I do this. So by now, we've probably I, I clicked that about six or seven times. So uh, yeah, it's already over 10,000 generations, which for human beings is about mm, 10,000 generations of humans. That's 18 years. It's already 180,000 years for just one gene, by the way, just one Mendelian trait, not a polygenic trait or anything. Just one. Even let's say this is polytrival. Let's say this is wet ear wax and armpit. Okay. Already took 180,000 years, nigga, for this to occur. Based on the human-based mutation rate. So, so it's already miraculous, okay? Every mutation that ever occurred in the human genome since 225,000 years ago is, is, a, is a miracle. We trace our lineage back, like, like Stephen Milo, like, oh, we trace it back to 6 million years, Aaron Ross. Six, no, we trace it back to one guy, the Y chromosome Adam, and the mitochondria DNA Eve. Genomically, we trace back to two individuals that lived contemporaneously 225,000 years ago in East Africa. That is what the science says. And according to these niggas, own science... Doesn't make sense. So it reached fixation here. So 104, oh, 1,040-ish generations. 
from when it emerged at generation. So the mutation emerged, it took about 230, uh, 240 generations for the mutation to occur. Then it took another, oh geez, let's see, another 600 generations to reach fixation. This is, I mean, guys, like let's, and that is a gene that gives a 10% benefit. That, that, that makes lactose tolerance, that's right in the ballpark. That's not ear, wet earwax and body odor. That's something, that is, that's like lactose tolerant to your fitness boost. Now it's like an extra centimeter of K9. That's like an extra 15 kilograms on your rivals to give you 10% more babies on average for those who have this gene than all the others. 10% more babies. 10% more, bro. That means if all of these animals, let's say an entire population has on average like 90, 90 offspring, your population is going to have 100 if they have these genes. That's actually significant. That is the 10% addition of, of fitness is significant. And even having just one of these offers a 5% benefit. So a gene that is directly beneficial and is within the realm of possibility for what the fitness of a gene will be, because again, how you calculate fitness, look at the number of offspring between the genotypes. This is the Hardy-Weinberg format, assuming other pressures are not in place, yada, yada, yada. But that's why you do fitness in the first place. That's why you calculate fitness and then look at the base mutation rate. And then after looking at the average fitness, looking at the mutation rate, getting a general idea of what the benefit would be. Most of the benefits are actually rather minor, but significant statistically. And then you get this. You get that it takes hundreds of generations for a mutation to occur if it ever does occur in this population. And then you have to assume that after that amount of time, that it'll take hundreds of generations for it to reach fixation. And if we say there's source sync migration on here and we go again, Ooh, it never even reaches fixation because of migration. That's another thing. Oh, I forgot to mention. If if these uh, uh, populations are in any way geographically isolated whatsoever, then you don't ever get fixation happening. Isn't science wonderful? I can go in with science and make you look like a giant fucking idiot. Wow, it's almost as if you're not dealing with a bunch of pulpit creationists and actually dealing with somebody that understands genomics. Wow. When I actually use tools, academic tools, to back up the shit that I say, wow, suddenly it's very hard to actually talk shit now. Wow. Because if a population isn't genetically isolated, if they have any amount of genetic diversity whatsoever, even with genetic drift, you're going to get a heterozygous population. Not everybody's going to have wet earwax. Not everyone's going to have brown hair. Not everybody's going to be blonde-haired and blue-eyed. Genetic drift my ass. It takes hundreds, if not thousands, of generations, even in a bottlenecked population, for these changes to occur. And you're telling me that on average, we've had 44 base pair differences between human beings and chimps, and for some reason, you think that that holds water? That our magical transformation from chimpanzees totally makes sense, even though when I go in and I check the data for myself, it doesn't fucking add up. And it's like, oh, well, you're being overly simplistic. I'm like, I'm not relying on a paper to deliver this data. I'm plugging in the raw ass numbers directly into a model, directly into a population genetics simulator. And what it tells me is that these mutations, if they ever actually occur, take dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of generations to emerge and then to reach fixation. And you're telling me these genes just are like, boom, 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 boom. One after another, over time, compounding, adding together. It's like, dude, this is a bunch of bullshit. You're feeding me some bullshit. That's why I made this, made this whole thing in the first place is because 
it really it really irks the shit out of me that these guys have 640,000 followers, 15, 115,318 views, a bunch of people who are just drinking this evolutionist Kool-Aid when all of the genomic evidence points otherwise. So let's go back to this dude's arguments. I'm about to do this at like double speed, by the way, because one, you can't hear it anyway, and two, he kind of talks slow. Okay, he's like, the possibility that they're right. So he's he's postulating, there is a possibility that we are right, that life is intelligently designed. I don't know why you would possibly think that based on the fact that, you know, things that can be coded and it doesn't make any fucking sense for things to randomly emerge or happen at all in the world. Nothing's truly random. What we know about life and we know about the universe is that there's always a cause and effect. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction and that precipitates results. It's like the butterfly effect, but for very minute phenomena in physics. We know that Mars, there's a paper that just came out that showed that Mars influences deep sea currents. Milankovic cycles, all of this shit that we go into every single day, things that we don't even think are related to one another, turns out to be foundational. Who knew the moon had to deal with the tides? That the moon influences the ocean's currents? And that Mars now influences the ocean? Does Venus influence the ocean currents? Does Jupiter? Does the sun? The answer to all of these things is basically yes. Nothing is fucking random in the universe. Everything is ordered. There's almost nothing truly random in the universe. The more you learn about the universe, the less random it looks. That is one of the most universal facts about physics. The more you look, the more ordered this shit really is. It's okay, cult of science, you can admit when you're wrong. They won't admit shit. They, they, they will not admit shit. And how many times the generations changed? Yeah, like what I just showed you the base mutation rate is so low, that mutation took almost half of a million years to occur. One mutation took half a million years to occur. I rolled that 1200 generation dice six or seven times, guys. And, and I, that's six or seven times after I, after I started counting, by the way. I was, just, I was just clicking, clicking, clicking. I'm like, wait a minute. Let me actually count how many times this is. With the base mutation of animals to what 2.2 times 10 to the ninth time 10 to the negative ninth power as a likelihood of a mutation, brah, that is that is astronomical. And I, even even talking about life emerging within 400 million years of the Earth, it's like it's entirely possible if that 4.2 million year thing isn't to be believed that life emerged in just 100 million years after the formation of the oceans. So Clint's going to go into these arguments. He's going to entertain the fact that might be right. He might want to watch my channel because he might be very very pleasantly surprised by our old friend Pop Gin and what it has to say about his numbers and theories. Aaron Ra probably would like to take some notes on this too, Mr. Uh, the Science is Settled. Tips Fedora. All right, let's see what he says. So uh, he talks about, oh, my, my straw man argument, yada, yada. And yet they make straw man out of paleontology all the time by cherry picking the fossil record. And so let's see what this guy says. So he talks about the cremation museum, yada, yada, yada. So there's a, it shows that the dinosaur ate birds. Birds, of course, emerged in the middle Jurassic. Again, talking about the hip morphology of birds, all these unique skeletal apomorphies that are specific to birds and they say they diverged from theropod dinosaurs they lived alongside most theropod manoraptor and theropods and they say they diverged from the it's like birds keep getting older and older every time we find a new fossil it's like the chinese break open a rock and now birds are 10 million years young, uh, older than they already were it's getting hilarious actually at first birds are like oh we think birds emerged in late cretaceous it, it actually started like oh we think birds actually emerged after the kt mass extinction event oh but then, then it turns out birds Okay, the modern lineage of birds have risen in the late Cretaceous. And they find evidence of birds going back further and further. Then they found them in the Jurassic. And now they're like, oh, well, birds are actually 140 million years. It's like, it's like what, happened, what happened to Archaeopteryx, bro? Now, now we have birds that are living contemporaneously with Archaeopteryx. It's pretty funny.
So his argument, yeah, so he's saying that there's other theropods that are non-ancestral to birds that uh, that were there. Okay, that's cool. So that one is a pretty superficial argument because it's easy to see chimps and human beings are still alive. Human beings didn't descend from chimps. They descended from a common ancestor. Even if one member tends to be more basal than the other, the other one magically went through shape-shifting to become what it is now. The other one didn't because of selection pressures, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Well, again, this is getting back into the idea of why changes happen, the likelihood of these changes. And quite frankly, what is, again, I look at the genetics. There's a lot of attempts by these guys to distract you with the fossil record, distract you with morphology distract you with natural selection ecological pressures but the actual mechanism of this change is random base mutations random a's switching to c's c's and g's swapping places you know adenine thymine guanine cytosine these base pairs swapping mistakes copying the genome resulting in base pair differences entire parts of the genome being swapped from one another this is what's happening these this is what mutation is and most of the time that fucks things right the hell up in your genome it does not end well for the animal it results in cancers it results in apoptosis and most of the time these somatic mutations do not go well Gametic mutations that result in something beneficial are astronomically rare. As I've demonstrated with the base mutation rate of 2.2 times 10 to the ninth negative ninth power, that's just a mutation. That doesn't even talk about if it's beneficial or not. That A1A2 mutation that I showed you right here in Popgen, this could be like nut cancer, but it offers a fitness advantage. Don't you know? Because non-effective mutations just die the hell out. If, if this mutation was, let, let's say this mutation was like, is this a big ass population? That's 10, that's a hundred thousand. Let's say the allele frequency is at half the population has a one, but it's dog shit. It is like, it, it is like nut cancer. A two, a one is like, not as bad, not as bad, but you're still probably going to have issues. And this is one. And you're still getting mutation. Go. And that shit will never. And look at migration as a thing. And it shows, oh, actually, you see that about 1% to 2% of the population will continue to have this. So it goes from half and immediately crashes to the floor. But you'll still see these, these nut cancer genes are still around. About 2% of the populations across the board now, roughly, will keep this mutation for nut cancer. So as you can see, the model can pretty easily simulate what we see out in the wild. It's like, okay, well, there's enough individuals, there's enough migration, there's enough allele frequency changes, but it will never go away. This negative mutation, now we just have to live with it. This is, this is, this is nut cancer mutation. There's going to be about 2% of the population now that's going to get nut cancer. Or I guess 4% of males. But eh, apparently isn't in, impacting their fitness enough. And this is horrible. Like, look at the difference. Like, good Lord. Look at that. Like, the fitness is 0.2 compared to 1? Man alive. That means that this, like, having this makes you, like, you're, you're five times more likely to have, you're going to have five times more kids if you're heterozygous for the A2A2. If you have both A1A1 alleles, it's damn near lethal. You're, you're basically sterilized. You're going to have one-fifth as many children as the A2A2. And if you have a pair of it, it's still going to kind of mess you up. But look, it's be, even with that, it still kind of hangs out in the population. So we saw what happens if you have a really beneficial mutation. Now, we soon see that birds are as old as crocodile, like unironically. But it's like you see what what, muta what happens when these mutations occur. So that starts out at 0%. That's assuming half the population has this deleterious gene. And, and still, even when you incre uh, incorporate migration, you incorporate, oh, there's a chance for it mutate. But still, you see that these alleles will still stick around, even though they are very deleterious.
That's just how genetics works. Even with genetic drift, you won't ever reach really fixation with this migration model. So let's say that A, A1A1, super great. Let's say A2A2 is 0.975. Okay, we're going back to the 10%, the 10% bonus. 10% more babies. And the base mutation rate, source sync. I'm going to keep this about the same for convenience sake and, of course, our base mutation rate. So let's see. It took... Ooh. So let's see here. Now we get to the interesting part, guys. Because like I mentioned before, you have a gene that gives you 10% more offspring. If you have it, even if you just have one copy of this gene instead of two, even if you're heterozygous, you still have a 5% more babies on average. But because of migration, this gene never reaches fixation in the population. So these models of the shape-shifting chimpanzees becoming human beings, or I beg your pardon, the, the, the common ancestor of chimps and humans, which looks just like a chimpanzee becoming a human being after 20 million base pair changes to become human, probably more, but you know that's an average between the two. And based on the base mammalian mutation rate of 2.2 times 10 to the negative ninth power for the mutation rate, we have to assume that one, the, gen the human population for the entirety of its development to modern humanity, all of it had to basically happen in a single isolated population. So even with the Mount Tobe eruption 75,000 years ago, they said, oh, well, hum humanity went down to 5,000 people lived in the same area. Cool. So let's say it's Mount Toba. All right. And, and there's this huge hominin gap in the fossil record, which is what we see from, from 700,000 years ago, whatever, whatever. Um, even if it's Mount Toba, we do have the hominid gap. Uh, we see the allele frequency is zero. The base mutation rate, of course, is right over here. Uh, A2 is going to become A1. A1 is very beneficial. 5% fitness boost if you have just one copy of the gene. A 10% fitness boost if you have both copies of the gene. Pretty standard. Let's go. All right. So what we see here, uh, and this has no migration. Actually, let's get rid of migration here. And run it again. Uh, and nothing happened. And it's it, okay. So in 1200 generations, uh, there was no mutation because this is the mutation rate. It's so low that even after this many generations, our lactose tolerance gene, whatever, our wet erex gene did not pop up, guys. Um, sorry, let's go again. So um, another 1200 generations passed and we did not get the gene, guys. We're going to roll that dice again. Uh, we still did not get the gene in any of the populations. Let's let's run those dice again. Uh, still did not get it. Let's roll it again. Still didn't get it. Still didn't get it. Nope, not there. We're just gonna run it for another twelve hundred generations. Oh man. Okay, now we're we're getting we're getting pretty high in the number of generations, guys. I'm just now I'm just clicking away. I've lost count. I'm losing count. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm just pressing go until the gene mutates. We're just waiting for the gene to mutate. Come on, mutation. Mutate. Mutate a Kazam. Come on. I've now pressed this button like 15 times. Guys, guys, evolutionists, help. Help. I, I need a miracle, guys. I need this, I need this gene to magically mutate for me. Come on. I'm using the base mammalian mutation rate. Where's my 44 base pairs per generation, bros? Where's my 44 base pair mutations per generation, bros? Where is this isn't stuck, by the way. It's literally it's running. Oh, there we go. Finally. Okay. Okay. So that took about how many clicks did that take? That took about uh we came from Ditto's. That's a ditto to you too. Okay, so um, I don't know if you guys counted how many clicks that was. I think that was above 20 clicks. Um, okay, guys, so it took it took uh, about half a million years, but we finally got there. <laughs> it, it took about, uh oh, I I'm assuming, I should have actually probably kept count. That was like, I was clicking there for a minute. That was um, for one population to mutate out of our hominid fossil graph population. That, that was about... From 750,000 200, to 500,000, 250,000 years. Yeah, I think I think about mm, I think about 25,000 generations passed with those dice that I rolled. So 
it took me about clicking for a solid one click every maybe second or so it refreshed and generated i clicked that mofo like 30 times before i got one population to mutate this gene that just shows you how rare mutation is in nature how much you you really don't want to mutate mutation means nothing or cancer in like 95 percent of circumstances in the vast majority of circumstances and i'm talking the vast majority it's either neutral or cancer that's why your body has all these genes to repair UV damage, to repair metabolism damage, to repair damage from free radicals in the genome, to repair damage from background radiation. Because you mutate and suddenly that mole is getting really big in it. You know, you, you mutate and like, oh man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm feeling kind of bad. It's like I should probably get checked for polyps or something. You know, most mutation in your body is going to mean cancer. Your body has to fight it off. Most of the time it actually does. But now the mutation has to happen in your germ cell. That germ cell has to become a gamete. That gamete has to inherit the gene through the process of meiosis one and two. Then that sperm, you have to get laid. Just already incredibly difficult in the modern day. Probably was also hard back in the day too. Let's not lie. And so that one, that one sperm that probably has the gene, maybe there's a group of sperm that have the genes, hopefully. But that one mutation now, that one copying error, error on that one gamete, now has to go out and at most you're going to get four because that's how meiosis one and two works. So you get at most four sperm out of billions that it's, that's going to have this mutation it has to magically make its way to the female, the gene having no influence on how it does, by the way. So it has to by luck get there and then it has to be born and then it has to go out into the wide world. So it doesn't even calculate. It doesn't even calculate all the pre-zygotic conditions that, that have to happen for this mutation to even see the light of day, literally. But we know that mutations occur. You know, it's not like we don't see mutations. We bred mutations, or rather we bred alleles in to be certain frequencies to where they overlap or whatever. It's, it's rare to breed a, a mutation. Most of the time when people talk about mutations, morphs of animals and stuff, like it wasn't a mutation that made pigeons white. We deliberately just messed with their allele frequencies to where we got our desired results by messing with their own genome through selective breeding. We didn't induce mutation. Um, we can import genes from other animals, but inducing mutation is incredibly difficult. And most of the time, it just doesn't work because when we induce mutation in animals, they just die most of the time. So mutation, for the most part, very negative. So again, this mutation took me easily, easily took me Let's say that's 20 clicks to be generous because I clicked, I was clicking, clicking, clicking. Even if that took me like 20 clicks, man, that's an extra zero on the back end of that. So that's 240,000 generations. And I was talking with Clint about, about that many generations happening between human beings and chimpanzees. So that's just one gene. So this one population, it took, let's see here, fixation occurred after 400 generations of it first occurring. So it took 400 generations for this gene to reach fixation in a population of 5,000 pro-humans in this one specific area. No other areas got it. So all the human beings got this gene and it only took them 240,000 generations, I think, and another 400 generations. And yet there's 44 average base pair differences. Gotcha. Gotcha. I'm picking up what you're putting down. So how many gene differences do we see between birds and theropod dinosaurs? Again, the reason I'm bringing up the chimp human thing is because this has been something closely researched. But think about the differences between a Uteraptor and a bird or even something like an Archaeopteryx and an Enantiornithine. Like how many base pair differences are, are between these creatures, which also diverge millions of years before one another. So I want to move on to like, okay, so I'm actually going to slow this down because this guy's actually going through some pretty interesting points. So I'm going to go to 1.25 speed. I'm going to go back to 630. observable and repeatable. So here, listen to what he said. So again, I don't have audio for copyright reasons, but what can I tell you about science? It's observable, repeatable. I like to say um, observable and testable, but it's observable and repeatable. Very important to remember that. 
It's observable and repeatable. Has anyone ever observed or repeated the Big Bang? No. Very clear point. Again, the same scientist that when the Voyager crossed out, like on the edge of the solar system, went through the heliopause, the heliopause was nothing like what scientists predicted it was. We didn't even fully leave our solar system and we were already wrong about what was outside of our immediate vicinity in space. And like I already told y'all about, oh, universal background radiation that we took from low Earth orbit in the middle of a solar system. Bruh. Really? You think you can take background radiation in the middle of a galaxy, in the middle of a solar system, and have it be objective? The background radiation you're seeing is from the sun. It's from the core of the galaxy. It is not from the deep depths of space. There is background radiation, my ass. You can't, you can't observe background radiation in the middle of a galaxy, in the middle of a solar system, in low Earth orbit. You're not even outside the Earth's magnetic field. How are you getting any reliable data whatsoever? Again, it has to be not only observable, but observed in an actually rational manner. Because even the things that are observable, does it, it's like unless you actually are using things in a smart way and being objective in how you interpret things, your inferences could be complete BS. That's something I've been pointing out from the very beginning in a lot of this. Like saying that the moon came from an ancient collision with the Earth by a protoplanet. It's like, okay, well, it's equally likely that the Earth and the moon formed at the exact same time out of the exact same material from the exact same disk or piece of the ring that made up the proto-solar system, consolidated from the same dust. That's why they have the same composition. Maybe we it doesn't require a massive proto-planet slamming into the Earth. What about that alternative hypothesis? That's honestly, to me, seems just as valid. No, I mean... Would it be cool if there was a cosmic collision like that? Cool, yeah. But in most simulations, it completely destroys the Earth. Or if they're like, oh, well, it skids off and it sprays a bunch of stuff into space. I'm like, okay, then interesting how there's really no evidence for that. You saying that this came from an Earth collision when it's equally just as likely that they formed the exact same time, which is kind of what we see. It's like the, the Earth and the moon are the same age, which already just makes it a little bit sus that they're even saying this, that the earth is older than the moon and came from a collision. But again, okay, has anyone ever observed or repeated the changing of a single-celled organism like an amoeba into a goat? Never seen it. They haven't even observed animals becoming truly multicellular or organizing themselves into tissues. They've never seen, like even the mud skipper, has been around for millions of years, has never evolved lungs, has never evolved legs, has never evolved a tongue, still spits on things to suck them up on land. In all this time, it hasn't even developed a tongue, guys. And mudskippers have been around for ages. And he says it's a battle over two different religions because it is. Because it is. Glad to see you back. Ho <laughs> hopefully you do more streams. i got to work tomorrow later, homie. And we are in the Discord. I'm going to try to drop the Discord link. And yes, guys, I have, I'm going to, I'm going to slaughter this chicken now. I have new internet in the office. Like, fuck yeah. Like, I hopefully, all of the struggles I've been going through the last few months, at least for the next six months, I'm going to have consistent Wi-Fi to stream with. And that is, it's such a relief. Like, I'm glad that I've taken this hiatus to work things out. It's been kind of stressful on the streaming end. But I'm really excited to get back on the horse. Like, I know that a lot of people have probably been really frustrated by like, oh, you know, he, I thought he was going to release, yada, yada, yada. I was going to release a video earlier this week. In fact, I was going to release this exact stream as a pre-recorded video. But then suddenly it's like the heavens open. It's like, oh, by the way, our internet's finally getting fixed that I said it was going to get fixed three months ago. And so like this entire time, you know, knock on wood, I've, I've actually, this stream's been going pretty great. I've had very few interruptions. And it's it's really awesome to 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 be back on the wagon. And thanks, bro. I'm glad that I'm glad that the day one still decided to show up. But you know, this is going back to the meat of this. What's religious? So I'm I'm gonna make myself just slightly bigger now. So what is religious about evolution? 
What is religious about evolution? Also, yes, I am. I am in Hawaii. That just explains. Hopefully, that explains a lot. I'm living in Hawaii. It's like they can't even get a pothole fixed. Good luck getting decent internet. But what does he mean by this is a religion? So going away from all of the sciency calculatory stuff. Oh, and also later in manual. This this again will all be uploaded and re-uploaded to my channel. Trying to download it. So if you miss the rest of the stream, then always come back later. This is something that I always pitch. And I will also be posting the Discord invite link. So one thing I do want to say. There are many ways to look at life. Again, look at things from a logical perspective. If we see that Louis Pasteur disproved spontaneous generation, that spoiling meat doesn't just suddenly produce maggots, that chicken broth doesn't just suddenly produce spores of bacteria. When we look at the evidence, the actual evidence of how rare a genomic change actually occurs, random mutation, how rare it actually is, what the effects of mutation are on animals, how many mutations have to take place for radical changes to occur, and what changes in animals we actually observe and test, we see that microevolution is scientific. Okay, We see that animals within a kind do change. We see that cats can become different cats, that, ca that different types of bovine can become different types of bovine. That Eohippus, Mesohippus, Pliohippus, all these different types of horse, they come from like. Kind comes from kind. Like comes from like. That's what we see in nature. It's not a shock to me that lions, tigers, jaguars, clouded leopards, puma, house cats, all could have come from a single cat common ancestor because we already see with, through microevolution what we already can achieve with dogs without even really altering their DNA. It's still a dog. Without even altering their DNA, we can just breed for alleles. We could just breed for alleles and get all kinds of differences. Just breed for different allele frequencies and you can go from a chihuahua to a Great Dane to an Irish wolfhound to a shih tzu, it's like everything in between with all kinds of different behaviors and phenotypes and all that. So what's to say that can't happen for animals? But what I'm not going to entertain is this the idea that you're going to replace God with random science that isn't observable and testable. The Big Bang. It's like Big Bang, Big Bang, what what banged? What, what's, what, what bang? Where was the bang? You're saying everything came from nothing. That life came from nothing, that the universe came from nothing, that it's all random, has no meaning. That's a religion. You're just replacing God with nothingness. What caused the Big Bang? Where did all the matter and energy in the universe come from? Energy cannot be created nor destroyed by current mo mo means of physics. How does nothingness produce everything under the current laws of physics? You have to break the laws of physics to create physics. That, don't, that, don't, that dog don't hunt. That makes no sense. Now you're saying that pond scum led to humanity in 3.8 billion years. That cells just randomly assembled themselves into existence. And then they randomly assembled themselves into tissues and organs and muscles for multicellular organisms in a massive explosion of diversity during the, the Cambrian and Precambrian. Then animals continue to shapeshift until one form of animals perfectly adapted to their freshwater ecosystem just suddenly decided to grow legs and walk on the land, which is literally what you say, because what possible fitness benefit could they possibly have to radically altering their physiology? Something I've already went over in 15 million years. So the common ancestor of all cats existed 15 million years ago. And that's the amount of time it took for a fish to become a fully terrestrial amphibian. As fully terrestrial as an amphibian can be. So this is why they say it's a religion. Because you're just replacing God with a big blank. With an effigy of science. With an effigy of technology. And if even if you don't believe in God or an intelligent creator or anything. You have to at least see the religious aspects of scientism. You have to at least see the religious and dogmatic aspects of it. Because where is the science? Again, is it observable and testable? Is the Big Bang an observable testable entity? No. 
is macroevolution observable testable entity? Animals going outside of kinds to radically change their physiology, morphology, and genetics to become different creatures? No. I don't believe that a chimp can become a human it, with, within a few million years, within a few hundred thousand years. It just doesn't, doesn't work out that way. There's too many differences in too little time. You might think a million years is a long ass amount of time, not when you're playing with the mutation rate of 2.2 to the negative, <laughs> to, to 10 to the negative nine mutations per generation. Not when, not when mutation is that improbable. 2.2 times 10 to the negative ninth power is the base mutation rate of mammals on average. On average. On average. And yet you're seeing timelines of 5 to 8 to 10 to 15 million years for animals completely and radically change their morphology, their niche, everything. This ain't, this ain't honey creepers and finches getting different sized beaks and different colors. Filling different niches by getting a little bigger, a beak a little longer, legs a little... No, this is like the fucking finch deciding to grow fucking arms and get talons and become a fucking velociraptor that runs along the ground. It grows teeth all of a sudden so it could better grip its prey. It's like, that's what you're saying, bro. And that's even more ridiculous because at least you can kind of vaguely see how you could rearrange the morphology that way. You're telling me that in the amount of time it took a chimp, a chimp ancestor and a human ancestor to become a human being... That basically a, a moderately upright chimp to become a human being. That a pig eating on the on, eating on the shore of a river became a fucking whale. The Pachycetus to Bacillosaurus transition was five million years. Talk about average base pair mutations per generation. You're you're going from a creature that is fully fucking aquatic, that is clearly a whale, from something that is a is a four toed hoofed omnivore, living entirely on land, not not aquatic in the least bit, and pointing to these transitional forms from animals that are clearly semi-aquatic and then being like it's like it's like taking a raccoon or like it's like taking a polecat an otter and a raccoon finding them within millions of years taking like a, an otter from like or taking like a, a pro scion a pro scionid like a raccoon ancestor from the miocene taking a fucking or a polecat or some other mustelid like a sable and then taking an otter from the pliocene or pleistocene and then taking like a modern, you know, modern sea otter or something or another otter relative and then being like, oh, here's a transition from otter to otter. It's like you can see how quickly and easily people in the future might confuse different lineages. If all you get of the modern biota is one to two percent of our current animal catalog, like which, what you get in the fossil record, one to two percent of all the species in a given area, excluding the areas that don't fossilize well, like tropical forests and deserts. Unless you're unless, like I mentioned earlier, unless you're buried by, buried by sand or in a flash flood, you're not going to get preserved in the fossil record. And even the ones that do, only a small percentage make it out. You'd be shocked how little and fragmentary fossil remains actually are, and how much science. It's like you might find a couple teeth from the earliest mammals found on Earth, a few scales, a few finger bones. Man, we had basically scrap little tiny scraps of bone for Spinosaurus for the longest time until more finds from Morocco happened because of the private fossil industry. So yes, this is a religion. Because microevolution is observable and testable, but macroevolution literally is just a replacement for an, an intelligent creator. It's a way to explain the universe that is not based on science, but is based on your fucking feelings. My fifis. I don't want to, I don't want to admit that intelligent design is a feasible alternative to this. That even interdimensionality that we all just popped out from the fourth dimension like a portal opened up and an animal hopped out to me sounds just as feasible i believe in quantum wormholes before i believe in shape-shifting animorphs because mm. scientists are repeatable never re okay Okay, so he says that because you don't see it, because it's not observable, not testable, it's not science. And he says that no one has ever directly observed these phenomena, the Big Bang or any of this stuff. Okay, so he says it's a fundamental understanding of what science is. Science is a science is based on the scientific method, which is a, a progressive and self-repeating model of inductive and deductive reasoning. So you induction and deduction is you take a hypothesis and if then, so, you know, if uh, lemons are sour, then there'll be acid in the fruit. Then you take that hypothesis. 
So you go and you pick lemons. You find lemons from a bunch of different lemon trees. Okay. And then one of the trees a control is apples. So you go and you try to, you pick a bunch of different lemons, a bunch of different lemons. And you squeeze the juice of the lemons and you squeeze the juice of your control apple. And you find that the base level of citric acid is significantly higher in the lemons than it is in the apple control. You then figure out that there's a statistically significant difference between the citric acid levels of a sweet fruit like an apple and a very sour fruit like a lemon. That is science. That's the scientific method in a nutshell, in a lemon shell. Because when life gives you lemons, you do science. This ain't science, nigga. Saying, oh, the world was was birthed out of a out of a singularity. And everything became and everything and the big bang and the, the protons formed when the quarks assimilated in the strong nuclear form. You sound like a Scientologist. You you sound like somebody who took a Mormon and then gave them peyote. You don't sound like a person of science when you come out here out the gate saying, oh, the big bounce, the universe is expanding because of we, we, we see things through the center of this red shifting. So that means that there's dark matter and dark energy that we can't observe and we haven't ever found it and we can't manage to find it or observe it. So, uh, but, but it has to exist. Uh, otherwise our math doesn't work. And then uh, every uh, that everything uh, came from came from everything was hot and just a ball of energy and then it all consolidated once it and then space expanded and, and then the galaxy formed and i'm like okay is that science that sounds like something made up by fucking l ron hubbard that sounds like something made up by some penny dreadful comic that, that, that sounds like lovecraft made that shit up i'd, I'd sooner believe that the, the entire universe is a turtle shell propped up by some eldritch entity before I'm going to believe in that shit. How is that a fundamental misunderstanding of science? You know, Mr. Answers in Genesis, you know, he, he might be a little bit mistaken. I'm actually going to blow this up, even though I'm reading it. It's like Mr. Answers in Genesis. Okay. He's, he's making a very clear point. It's not observable. It's not testable. I can, I observe the lemons. I can go to the lemon tree. I can see those lemons. I am not Ray Charles. I can see those damn lemons. I can cut open the lemon. I can taste the sour. These things are observable. Not just observable with one sense. Observable with multiple senses. It's a lemon attached to a lemon tree. I can tell by the leaf structure. I can tell by the bark. I pick the lemon. It's ripe. It's yellow. It has the nipple thing on the end of it. I cut it open. It has the little fleshy divisions inside. I pick up the pulpy fruit. I taste the lemon. The lemon is sour. So if I say, if lemons are sour, then their fruit contains more acid. I have my hypothesis. Now I am testing my hypothesis. I have my control because there's no point doing the experiment with only lemons. You have to compare it to something. So now I'm going to compare it to apples. So now my apples are control. I have my A, B, C, and D set. Three sets A, B, and C are different lemons from different lemon trees. And my D, my control, are apples from an apple tree. The apple tree does not look like the lemon tree. Guys, this is like fourth grade shit that I'm, that I'm breaking down to you, right? Now, this is science that scientists will teach you in the most basic ass biology course, okay? That is science. That shit right there is the essence of the scientific method. That is how we have like fleshlights and light bulbs and computers at all started with shit like that niggas going out and like dropping apples off of towers and you know figuring out the me mechanics of candlelight like those niggas back in the 16th century looking at cork under a microscope shout out to my nigga hook those people are what created the modern scientific method the antoine lavoisiers the isaac newtons those guys, bro, those dudes back in the dizzy, throwing it down with the if-thens, throwing it down with the controls, showing you straight up, this is observable, this is testable, like what Louis Pasteur did with the boiled flask. I boiled these flasks, I sealed the glass, they are still fresh to the modern day. 
Not a single microbe in any of those boiled flasks to the modern day. After over a century, his boiled flags don't have nary a microbe. They have not spoiled whatsoever. The man proved his point and is continuing to prove his point because his test was observable and it was replicable. It was testable. I can do the same shit to any four lemon trees. If I look at this groundbreaking paper, lemons proven to be sour because of high levels of citric acid, then you know what I can do? I can go to my backyard and be like, well, this guy seems like he's full of shit. I'm going to test my own lemons to see if they're sour. And so I'm going to go to my own lemon trees, three different trees, A, B, C, and then I'm going to go to like a plum tree and be like, okay, well, I'm going to use a different control and see if it's really true. And so I test the citric acid levels of my lemons compared to my plums. And damn, son, there's a statistically significant difference between the sours and the sweets. And then I can go in and be like, huh, this paper is corroborating this. Oh, both these guys are full of shit. I'm going to test my oranges and my grapefruit and my lemons and then use a control of a peach. And let's see if these mofos got their shit going. And just to spice things up, I'll add some cherries because I, I have an orchard. And so he goes and he tests all those. And he's like, well, damn, not only does the lemon have the highest level of citric acid, but all of the citrus seem to have higher levels of citric acid than these other sweeter fruits. So... This is how science progresses. Now we know citruses tend to have the most citric acid because somebody decided to play with some fucking lemons. When life gives you lemons, you make substantial breakthroughs in botany. When life gives you lemons, you add to the scientific community's knowledge base and push things further. When life gives you lemons, you actually do science to figure out what lemons are all up about. Now you can do big, bad things with citric acid. You can, you can go forward and figure out what makes citric acid so special. How, does plants, how do plants make it? What does it involve? And you figure out the citric acid cycle and all these things about plant metabolism, the role that it plays. You have to start somewhere with science. Science, science is layers. You build upon foundations of knowledge set upon by people doing very simple experiments and getting more and more technical over time. And soon you're going to be playing with car batteries because somebody two centuries ago was was figuring out about acid. Now, now you're getting into, into heavy territory. But this is all that science originally was. You go from playing with willow tree tinctures to bottling aspirin. You go from playing with bread to developing antibiotics. This is science. This is what science actually is. It isn't sitting in a room being like, I think the universe came from everything exploding from nothing. And I think pond scum is where everything... It's like, no, dude, that's like... That's you sitting in a big hippie circle smoking a bunch of ganja, eating, drinking a bunch of ayahuasca, being like, I have the answers to the universe. It's a big, and you got Stephen Hawking up there like, I remember when I first wrote my first paper and everybody did not understand the gravity of the universe. The black hole, black hole emerged and the universe was Burnt out of nothing. And all the... <laughs> this nigga's over here drooling, like, straight up mouthpiece, like, text-to-speech ass nigga. Hawk, like, uh, what, what is it? The 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 Carl Sagan? Like, it's like the Russell's teapot. If there's a, t a teapot in orbit, you do. how are you supposed to know him? And there was a teapot in orbit. <laughs> I'm the flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> and you have, like, the docking, the docking type dudes. Sitting there like, oh, actually, if you if you uh, estimate the preponderance of, of something like a, a magical sky daddy creating everything, uh, the, the sheer ridiculousness of, of such a proposition just flies in the face of it. And it's like they're just spewing a bunch of bullshit. They're not showing you how to turn lemons into science. They're not showing you the raw realities of population genetics. They're filling your ass full of figurative shit. They, they, are, they are just getting a tunnel and shoving it right up your ass and filling it full of shit. So you can go shit this out, make yourself look all big and smart, and then actually ignore the realities of the universe. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, so where did it come from? Mr. Science. Mr. Science. Mr. Science. Energy can't be created or destroyed. Only life can beget life. How do you answer these questions? Oh, capital. Oh, it's oh, oh, the preponderances. Oh, oh, 
Like, it's like they can't answer the most basic ass questions because it is a religion. Because it is just dogma at the end of the day. That's all it is. And so he's going to sit here and be like, oh, what's repeatedly observable in testimony? We don't need it. In fact, we don't need science for what is repeatedly er observable by but repetition. We create test models that cannot be observed using what we can. This is not what science is. Clint, if you ever watch this video. I can't with these niggas, bro. I can't. I just, I just can't. Like, I can barely watch past this part. In fact, I didn't watch past it. If you actually look at the video, I, I did not get past this part. What the fuck am I looking at right now? Science is a methodology by which we create and test models of what cannot be observed using what we can. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, you know what? You know what? I changed my mind. I fully agree. I fully agree. 100% agree. Oh, 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 no, 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 not, not this though. Not, no, 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 not this. Not, no, 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 This is this fake news. Not, not this though. Not this though. Ignore, ignore this shit. So it's like, you better be, you better be careful. Your definitions there, buddy, because, ooh, my my model tests aren't looking too hot for your little evolutionist argument. Ain't looking too hot so far. You know, I'm, I'm coming at you with your own. You're, oh, you said it first. You said it first. I'm testing my model over here. I'm testing this model. You know, like Dan Schneider tests his models. I'm testing my models, bro. I'm the Dan Schneider of science. Actually, I, I take that. I am not the Dan Schneider of science, okay? I'm not asking anybody to get naked or show feet, all right? But we continue before John. So now this man's changed the definition of what science is. I wish this Red Bull was a white claw. I'm about to mentally check out. Ooh, so we're talking about matching results in the model. And he's, so you see this, you see what's going on. He's using a bunch of big fancy words. This is what we call in the game mental gymnastics. I don't know if you guys are familiar with mental gymnastics. If you've ever talked to a woman, you're probably very familiar with mental gymnastics. He's now caught in a little tiny corner called, we know what science is. So I'm actually going to Google the real definition of what science is. So let's look at the definition of science. According to... Duh, 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 duh. Okay, so let's go right to our... So so let's let's take a little rewind and go back to his definition of science. So this is science as, as according to uh, Clinton... Uh, I forget Clint's last name. Um, yeah, I, it's it's I I used to know, but I I forgot. So this is his definition of science. Now, what do we get when we look up science definition? Science: the observation, identification, description, experimental investigation, and theoretical explanation of phenomena. Now, let's see how this dictionary definition compares. You know what this reminds me of, guys? Have you ever talked to, like, a tranny? Uh, let me remember. Have you ever talked to a transgender individual who, when you say, like, okay, you know, sex and gender are the same. There's only two genders, yada, yada. And they, and they go on autistic rant, like, actually, the definition of gender is? that. That's literally the evolutionary biologist version of this this nigga says i guess he's not a nigga my bad but um this negro clint says science is a methodology by which we create and test models of what cannot be observed using what we can but the definition of science according to i believe this is merriam webster no american heritage dictionary of the english language so let's look what merriam webster says Knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested, obtained and tested through scientific method. Boom. 
Boom. Miriam Webster right here in the King's English. Okay, I guess it's not like Oxford, so I guess not technically the King's English, but the, the, the president's English, knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through scientific method. And the definition of scientific method, ladies and gentlemen, that is the principles and procedures for the systemic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem, the collection of data through observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. The If the lemons are sour, then they probably have more acid than other fruits. That is science. This horse shit right here ain't science. That ain't science. I hate to break it to you, Clint. But that ain't science. It's like that Ice Cube skit. It's like, I'm not gay. I have relationships with women and sex with men. Like, newsflash, that means you're gay. And that's how I feel right now, except with science. Clint, I know you mean well, buddy. But you can't change the definition of science and shift the goalpost just to fit your own narrative. We're seven minutes and 57 seconds in to a video that's over half an hour long and i'm already already very tired i'm very tired clint I, i'm really trying hard not to say clit by the way like i i've almost slipped up several times almost calling him clit and i'm really trying hard not to don't never name your if you're gonna call your kid clint <laughs> if, if you're if you're gonna call your kid clint for the love of God, call him my Clinton, please. Call him, call him like the whole, like, don't do it. Please don't do it to your child. Like, guys, I, I got I to gotta be real with you right now. Do not, please, for the love of, I know, because I know that there's going to be white people that are eventually going to watch this. And this, this is going to you. I've never met an Asian named Clint. Maybe there's a few brothers named Clint. Please, for the love of God, do not name your kid Clint in 2024, guys. If you ever have kids, please do not name them Clint. That is just the number. I mean, seriously, the number of times I almost called this dude Clint on multiple occasions. Just, just like Clint. You miss one fucking T. You, you, you miss one N. You miss one nasal. You, you just glide over the N in Clint, and it's just fucking Clint. Like it's just straight Clint. Like full stop. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I I, I want to be objective, but like, bro, like who the fuck names her kid? Clint? Anyway. But the man just goes through a bunch. Like, dude, his mental gymnastics go over like a bunch. So it says for evolution to be true, it requires a gain of information. We've never observed that, but we do observe a clear loss of information. That means most mutations result in something called pseudogenes. Now, pseudogenes, what is a pseudogene? Now I shall go and regale you with the lovely realities of pseudogenes. So a pseudogene is a gene. Actually, I'll just give you the straight up definition because fuck what I have to say. I have a lot of fun going to the internet and going to other sources that corroborate my beliefs because I am not a barbarian. So we're going to go and look up the definition of a pseudogene. And I'm just going to plop that right here in the stream. Bada bing, bada boom. A pseudogene is a segment of DNA that resembles a gene, but is not functional and is usually not transcribed. The other definition is a segment of DNA that is part of the genome of an organism and which is similar to a gene, but does not code for a gene product. Mutation in a gene will usually result in a pseudogene emerging. And there are dozens, if not hundreds of pseudogenes in our genome. This is what she means. Clint is going to obscure this and twist it to fit his narrative like he's been doing this whole time. So. See, is a, there's a variation within, within kinds. This is what we see in the fossil record. Is a clear variation within kinds. Well, what they're doing is they're taking animals that look kind of in between those from earlier iterations. And just because they're found at earlier points in time, they're like, oh, well, this is clearly an ancestor. That's not what this implies. 
you could have massive ghost lineages and often do that get in the way of this. Again, they cherry pick the fossil record because they could easily say, oh, well, this came from this, this came from this. But they obscure all the times where they say that this animal came from this animal, this animal's likely ancestor, and they find something that completely BTFOs their entire argument. Like there was a long time where they were like, oh, well, all of humanity comes from erectus. But then there's multiple features in erectus that like, for example, in their wrist and shoulder morphology, certain aspects of their brain morphology, brain case, et cetera, that are not found in any modern human lineages whatsoever and really don't correlate to like what you would see in modern humans. And yet Homo erectus and humans overlap. So clearly human beings did not come from what we perceive to be Homo erectus. That's just one example. That's one thing to tie it in with hominids. So there's already, there was cherry picking that always occurs, but then you find more fossils and suddenly you have to take back what you say. And they're like, oh, well, science is ever evolving. But you're trying to craft entire narratives based off of incomplete information. Yeah, so natural selection does not provide any brand new information. Again, the mechanism for change is random base mutation. That's what actually leads to changes because otherwise you just get variations within a species. You get like different breeds of dog or different types of finch. What you don't get, and Galapagos finches can reproduce and provide fertile offspring, which has been proven by the way. So they are just a species complex. You get variations in beak shape. You get variations in size. You get variations in color even. What you don't get is a rapid and total change of a creature's niche into something completely different. You don't get a pig creature turning into a whale and you don't get a horse turning into a lion. You don't, you don't like the cat being stranded on a desert Island. The cat doesn't suddenly become a giant omnivorous cat cow or something. It just dies because it is not physiologically ad adapted to an omnivorous diet. Can you eventually have a cat that gets enough enzymes or gut flora to where it can have an omnivorous diet? Sure. But you're not going to see any cat species turn into a seal or turn into some radically different organism. You're not going to see like monkey cats that gives the cats going trees and get opposable thumbs and now they're swinging from branches like a monkey. You're not seeing that. You get cats becoming different types of cats. Finches become different types of finches. You're not seeing animals radically change their physiology to become something completely different because most of the time, like I showed you in my base, in my models that he's so lo in love with, oh, we models of things we can't observe. It takes hundreds of thousands of years for a gene not only to mutate but to reach fixation hundreds of generations thousands of generations even for even a relatively beneficial gene to reach fixation let alone a random base pair change of the genome and what we do see is all of these pseudogenes in humans everything from scent receptors to it's it's like we have Tons of pseudogenes, tons of pseudogenes showing that there has been a clear degradation of our genomic code over time as a result of random gene mutations. Now he's shilling his Patreon, which doesn't shock me. Evolution requires a gain of information, something that we've, quote, never observed. What do we observe is a loss of information. So it would take a loss of information to go from a lion to a house cat. Yeah, because there's variation within what she calls created kinds. Okay, so her argument... Okay, so we do have evidence of just two humans, but even, even though he's going through a strictly Christian-based creationist argument based on strict interpretation of the Bible, I want to get to the meat and blood of his argument. Yeah, so natural selection is already pulling from information that actually already exists, and we see this. The, the Galapagos finches can reproduce and create fertile offspring. They can hybridize successfully, even if those hybrids have perhaps reduced fitness, that isn't always the, the majority of cases. These creatures can hybridize to produce fertile offspring. By the biological definition of the species concept, they are the same species. By a phylogenetic or morphological definition of the species concept, they could be classified as different species, and they technically are. Remember that government bodies saying that, oh, XYZ is a species, there's multiple different entities that, that have different 
opinions on what constitutes a species and what doesn't. A species is an arbitrary designation, guys. Remember, my definition of a species relies on the biological concept because if it can reproduce and produce fertile offspring or has the potential of doing it outside of reproductive barriers or whatever, there's reasons animals want to, you know, specifically breed with one kind of animal, even if it's a difference in song, as long as the capability is there, they're within the same species. So what does this mean? This means that coyotes, North American coyotes and gray wolves are technically the same species. As are any species of canid in the wild capable of interbreeding and producing the same offspring. There's signs that African wild dogs and doles had have shared genomes and that they can also interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And it makes it messy because like, oh, well, now a bunch of animals that are really different from each other are now technically the same species. But it's like polar bears and grizzly bears are so different, though. They can't be the same species. Like they can't be subspecies of the same animal, even though they can reproduce and make fer fully fertile, fully functional offspring. That doesn't make sense. How does that make sense? It makes a lot more sense than randomly putting them into two different clades and saying that they diverge. Da, 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 da. It's bullshit. So we go on here. With Clint talking about, you know, something that is completely opposite of evolution. Even though most of what we see with beak changes and Galapagos finches within just a couple of generations are mostly just allele frequency changes within the within the finches themselves. There has not been a substantial genetic alteration of Galapagos finches. He's showing Galapagos finches, but what's hilarious is these guys, which are actually technically tanagers, I believe. I mean, they're gen not ge that genetically distant from one another whatsoever. Again, they're still close enough to related to where multiple ones of them have obviously hybridized. So even though they have partitioned themselves into niches and do have a, a sexual selection pressure to kind of stay within their kinds, hybridization does occur and has been observed. And in certain cases, the hybrids themselves lead to new species. So what do you know? It turns out that the example that you're using in your very own slide actually can contradicts your own argument so you you picked a very bad uh bad example to use as a visual aid because galapagos finches actually aren't that genetically different from one another so big oof okay so we talked about struggle He's referring to genetic material. So the contention is that evolution requires a gain of genetic material. And while that isn't true in every instance, some evolution can occur through a loss of genetic material. By and large, that's a fair point. You aren't going to go from the simplest organisms that have ever existed to complex multicellular life without gaining additional genetic material at some point. So he, she, he's saying we've never observed this. So there, so there is an increase of genome, instantaneous speciation. Okay, so he says genomic reduplication. He's being very disingenuous because this almost only ever occurs with plants and microbes. This, this, this gain of genetic information is not something you see in mammals. So even though she specifically talked about lions and cats, He's being very disingenuous because he's specifically pointing to animals that are specifically pointing to life forms that have nothing to do with the actual example involved. And oftentimes these increased genetic information don't lead to new genes. It, it, they reduplicate the same genes. There's no new genes being created. There's no new mutation that is resulting in new genes occur. The mutations that matter are these base pair differences. Reduplication of the genome doesn't mean shit. That's a change in ploidy. What it what really matters is those base pair differences, those those A's, T's, C's, and G's swapping places or changing. That's what really fucking matters. That's what leads to novel new genes. Reduplicating the same five, 10 genes may strengthen the expression of the gene, which fair enough is still a mutation, but it's not new genetic material. It's just additional genetic material. It's not new. It's additional. It's more genetic information, yes, but it's not new genetic information, and that's the point. You would you need more of these base pair differences to manifest themselves. This is why I talk about base pair differences, not gene differences, but base pair differences, because we want to see exactly where the differences are between these organisms. He's talking about more information, but it's not new. 
It's just the same genes over and over again. So again, being very disingenuous here with this argument. Yeah, so he, he addresses this now. So it adds new copies, but nothing new. So he talks about other forms of mutation now. So other forms of mutation like this, right? Other forms of mutation that take tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years to occur in just one circumstance. And you could say, oh, well, a bunch of different mutations could be cooking simultaneously. But then mm, the issue then lies in the number of base pair differences that we do see. The amount of information, new information gained does not correlate with the base mutation rate of organisms, nor with what the realities of population genetics are. To where these genes would have to be wildly beneficial to reach fixation when most of the base pair differences are not actually that beneficial. So a loss of function is exactly what she's talking about because turning a gene into a pseudogene, you now lose the benefit of that gene. That doesn't increase the animal's fitness. Therefore, there's less of a selection pressure for that gene. Therefore, it takes even longer for it to reach fixation. So you're tripping over your own dick by saying that, oh, well, you know, that causes a loss of function. I'm like, so it doesn't really give you, that means that if there's a loss of function, that means that its changes are negligible. That means the fitness difference between this is like 99 and like 98, maybe a few percentage differences. And look, this shit doesn't even fucking emerge at all. It's like, even in an infinite population, it doesn't even reach half the population. A, a gene that that's, ne that's that negligible, even if there is a slight fitness advantage, doesn't even show up in an infinite population after a, uh, until you get to like a thousand generate it's it's like this first showed up in an infinite population almost from the get and look how long it took to even in an infinite population look how long it took to even reach not even five percent of the population 1200 generations not even five percent of the population might be on its way to fixation in this infinite population but it's sure as hell not going to reach fixation in a finite population, even if it does emerge. And I could, I could just keep rolling this and rolling this and rolling this and rolling this. Unless the mutation is directly beneficial to the organism, there's not a snowball's chance in hell it will it'll reach fixation any meaningful, appreciable amount of time, even when we go with source sync migration. Go. And this, this is... I need to play with these numbers. But even then again, you see it doesn't reach fixation. Doesn't even come close to reaching fixation. Doesn't even peak, but it's not even in the 80th percentile. It's basically negligible. And it never will reach fixation. I could keep this going on for years. It'll never reach fixation. Won't even go into the 80th percentile at any point in time. My models are valid according to Flint too. Clint, Flint, Clit, whatever his name is. So riddle me that batman like i i am tired i'm exhausted by this dude already so it's like he says a mutation in one causing it will cause it to do something new and that's a gain of a new function fair enough how is how likely is that to happen now you have to have two mutations back to back those mutations also have to be beneficial we already see though that the likelihood of that happening within a mammal is 2.2 times 10 to the negative nine. So now you need two mutations before this even does something. You need two different mutations. One of them is drastic because it results in the copying of the gene. You now need two different mutation events in the same locus, which again increases the statistical likelihood of that because that's the entire genome. A mutation can happen anywhere. You need now two mutations in the same locus in order to get the a desired effect for it finally to be a beneficial mutation. Again, man, look at the genome. Look at the genetic level. Stop getting caught up in the fossils. It's like his very superficial view of genetics is infuriating to me. 
He doesn't actually look at genetics in a serious way. He doesn't understand the realities of population genetics. He doesn't understand that these mutations have to reach fixation, that these mutations have to run the gamut of genetic drift, that they have to have some sort of clear fitness benefit from the beginning if they have any hope of getting passed on to multiple individuals. Because if you, these mutations are happening in one individual at a time. Even if all four gametes produced by meiosis 2 end up in females, it's like four out of a batch of hundreds and hundreds of eggs. So you're starting with a very small, sometimes singular individuals that then have to go out and get, shoot their load, shoot their shot, and you have to hope that this mutation is happening in a closed, consolidated population in a, in a species that isn't geographically spread out and hoping and praying that over time, that one specific population is, oh, it's, it's going to change and be different. We see that animals change. We see that allele frequencies change. But actual new genetic information comes about after hundreds hundreds of generations and that's still no guarantee it will survive and it's still no guarantee it'll even be represented a majority of the population let alone reach fixation so these are the realities of population genetics guys what what what, what clint is telling you is a bunch of gobbledygook bullshit it's like real information but ignoring all of the relevant context and rigor that science demands. So the amount of new information is what they care about. It's like it, it's 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 like okay. So if there's a couple mutations that that works out for over a couple hundred thousand years, then cool. But then explain how you even get get how do we get from a house cat to a line in the time frame we're talking about. And that's not even that ridiculous to me because there's not really that much genomic difference between a house cat and a lion. Yeah, it'll take a lot of time, but I can I can wrap my mind around it, would, it taking 14 million years to go from something like, you know, a lynx to a lion. I can wrap my head around that because it's just a bigger cat in it. But going from a lungfish to a reptile in 35 million years I'm sorry, that's that's where you fucking lose me. It took that amount of time for horses to go from three toes to one toe. You're telling me now that you're going from a fish to a fucking lizard in 35 million years. Birds have been around for 140 million years, by the way. So it's like, where the f like, what in what in the fiddler's fuck are these evolutionists even on about anymore? So how much information is the line for age? 38 chromosomes. So they both have the same number of chromosomes. So that shows that they are within a kind. Ain't that some shit? They are within a kind. Human beings and chimps don't have the same number of chromosomes. But a house cat and a lion do. Interesting. Interesting. So we're so close to chimps, yeah? Six million years removed, yeah? But cats and lions that diverged over 10 million years ago have the same number of chromosomes still. They're both still cats. So this is what I'm saying. I'm like, you know, it isn't just a matter of gain of information, this and that. It's, the, it's how that gain of information happens, how long it takes for that gain of information to happen. So... So it goes over created kinds. So being able to hybridize with any other member of a kind is enough to conf confirm membership to a given kind and hybrids do not need to be viable for more than a few cell divisions for their existence to confirm that hybridizing species are members of the same kind. So there's this is the biological species concept with some extra steps. That's all the created kind is to, to answer that question. And it is a science, it is basically kind of pushing the boundaries of what we define as a species, but no more than what I think science is doing, which is the opposite, which is taking animals that clearly do not need to be subdivided like giraffes and cheetah and breaking them off into subspecies where they don't need to be. Making coyotes and American gray wolves a different species, making grizzly bears and, and, grizzly and polar bears different species, ridiculous. They're not different species. They can hybridize and they don't have this issue of like, oh, they're, they're completely viable. Growlers, 
rollers are completely viable. They produce sperm and egg that can be fertilized with each other, with polar bears or grizzlies. doesn't matter. They're viable. They can reproduce. Don't even see that with pantherine cats. Like they're sterile. Mules and horses clearly are part of a kind, but they're mostly sterile. Some mule, uh, female mules can actually reproduce, but you, marital sterility is a pretty clear sign that you're dealing with two different species. Because realistically, if you can't reproduce and produce completely fertile offspring, you might be definitely related, but you're not the same species, clearly. So they believe that diversification and speciation can happen within a kind, which makes sense. But what he's postulating is the alternative, which is human beings coming from other animals because of similarities in the genome. So how many different ways do you, can you, I mentioned this early, how many different ways can you code for bilateral symmetry? How many different ways can you code for two arms, two legs? How many di different ways can you code for eyes being up front of the body, the head? It's like most of the regulatory Hox genes, all of that are very common throughout all animals because these are universal ways that the body can build this. All your genes are is a template for your ribosomes to build proteins. Every single gene just re results in a different protein, a different folding of amino acids into different shapes to do different things. Every single gene is just that. All it does is unfurl in certain parts. The RNA is slapped onto the guy, lined up, sent outside of the cell, sent to a ribosome. The ribosome copies that shit out with amino acids using the codons. Bada bing, bada boom, lines it up. you got a protein. That does a thing in the cell. That's every single gene that you have. Genes are not like magic spells. All the, Every single gene leads to the creation of a specific protein or set of, set of proteins. That's all that they do. Now, how many different ways physically are there to skin a cat or crack an egg? Of course, you're going to end up with similar genetic templates when you get down to the most basic of levels. Bilateral symmetry or radial symmetry, how many different ways are there to code for that? Would it make sense that animals will converge on a similar format, especially if there's an intelligent creation going on? Because if it was random, then yeah, it does look ridiculous if you think about it from a random mindset, but it makes total sense if you think about it from a creationist mindset or an intelligent design mindset or a portal theory mindset, or even just from the mindset of physics, where it makes more sense for similar things to come from similar sources. Just because there's lightning on two different planets doesn't mean, oh, these planets come from the same origin because there's lightning and weather. It's you, You're taking the most fundamental biological elements of life in general and saying, oh, all life has a common origin, perhaps, but not due to evolutionary, evolutionary shape-shifting. It's because all life has to be based on the similar formats because some things are universal just as a result of living in gravity, living in a world defined by the laws of physics. Being under the influence of the same forces, it makes sense to have the same basic templates for things. But now we're getting into the realm of, you know, where do animals come from? And again, it all goes back to the pond scum. It all goes back to life being randomly created because how do you reconcile? If, it, if you need one miracle for life to be created, it makes sense that now you invent everything else. This whole idea of animals radically changing is all just an explainer for abiogenesis. You can cut out an intelligent design, you can cut out, you know, plasma theology, you can cut out the ultra tours and the portals to uh, different dimensions and every other possible alternative there is for a theory of life self-assembling and then magically changing into what it is today. The presumption, the presumptuousness is so heavy and so clear. So humans and Neanderthals can hybridize, produce fertile offspring. This is confirmed by science. He pulled up an example, which again is refutable because turns out the scientific name for Neanderthals is Homo sapiens Neanderthalis. And I say that again, it's like, you know, if I look up like a Neanderthal, if I look up a Neanderthal, I'm pretty sure this is what they define it now. I'll just go, I'm just going to go to Wikipedia. Homo sapiens Neanderthalis. Neanderthals are a subspecies of human being. So once again, the man pulls up an example that defeats his own argument. Because it turns out that even the scientific community believes that Neanderthals are just a subspecies of Homo sapiens. Yikes.
So, guys, I'm really hoping that after two and a half hours, my response to Clint is pretty clear. And so he talks about the difference of, of what biologists believe in young earth creationists, and yet pulls up an example. Pulls up an example that. <laughs> good Lord. That's just. It's just silly. It's just so silly. Neanderthals are the literally the worst example you could possibly use are Neanderthals. Because Neanderthals are Homo sapiens Neanderthals. They're a subspecies of human being. See, these guys don't want to debate me. They don't want to debate me. They really don't. Because once you actually get down to it, Clint, and this is something I try to let you know in the very beginning. Bro, macroevolution is not observable and testable. You can't change the definition of science to suit your own philosophy. The definition of science is clear. The mechanism for change of the genome is clear. What science has observed is clear. All of this magical animal shape shifting between different forms into different entities against niches, against physiology, leaving their niche for another niche, this cherry picking of the fossil record to enforce your beliefs, this mental gymnastics that you use to obfuscate and jump over the facts, to, to use gotchas in one area and ignore them once you move on to the other and hope they don't bring it up. It's like you tackle the most softball creationist intelligent design arguments, but don't actually go into the meat and bones like I do. And yeah, you'll, you'll hand wave away my comments, you hand wave away this stream, maybe. I forgot, I'm going to tag and name drop these guys after the, after the post-production. But like, guys, I'm going to leave you with this. I'm, I'm about to wrap this. I'm, I'm a two hours and 41 minutes in, and I'm going to post a Discord link for you guys, uh, for everybody here. And... Basically, all I got to say is this. Uh, I, I, let, let, me, let me watch a little bit more. I, I want to see if he has another argument. Because I'm, I'm honestly just kind of done listening to this dude now. Because he's, he's pulling up examples that... So I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm tired of his argument. I'm, I, for the rest of this, I basically already covered it. I've hammered in, in on it. This, the guy just wants to change. Again, when life gives you lemons, do science. I've told you guys what the scientific method is. I've told you that it's based on if-thens, things that are observable and testable. Is shape-shifting animals observable and testable? When, when we look at PopGen and we plug those numbers into PopGen, and we plug them into models that he says are just as valid as observable and testable data. When I plug them into models and what I see is it takes hundreds of thousands of years for gene, these genes to pop up. Hundreds of generations, thousands of generations for the genes to emerge in even just one population. That in many cases, if there's migration between different areas, it will never reach fixation. That most genes... That are, that are mutated, either turn into pseudogenes, become unfunctional. That's how you get albinism. That's how you get hemophilia. These mutations are not beneficial. Sometimes you luck out with lactose tolerance. But the amount of unique mutations to the human genome that have occurred in just the last 225,000 years since we had mitochondrial DNA, Eve, and Y chromosome, Adam, the two humans we all technically all descend from, even outside of nothing to do with the biblical argument. Does any of this actually prove macroevolution? You point to microevolution, say microevolution plus time leads to macroevolution. But the amount of physiological and genomic change that has to occur for an animal to go outside of its kind to become something radically different is nothing like similar animals becoming slightly different. Cats becoming different types of cats, bears becoming different types of bears, 
deer becoming different types of deer is not not insane. But fish becoming lizards, pigs becoming whales, chimps becoming people, that shit's fucking insanity. Especially once you get down to the pond scum level. Pond scum randomly assembling itself to be life forms. That's not observable and testable. The boiled flask experiment is observable and testable. If we're talking about observable and, and testable, there is no abiogenesis. Admit that it's a religion. Admit that it's your spiritual belief because the science does not support it. Science does not support magically shape-shifting animals, Clint. And you can dance around the issue all you want. The genomic data is not there. Every genomic model, far more advanced than me, far more technical, does not reinforce what we see in the fossil record whatsoever. Forget millions of years, man. What you're looking at, you'll be lucky sometimes to get a few mutations over a few thousand years, maybe a mutation here and there. And look what it does. It, most of the time it causes diseases. It causes disorders. It causes loss of function. Most mutation either does nothing or it is directly harmful to the organism. And the larger the amount of genetic change, the higher the likelihood of deleterious effects. Just because strawberries change their ploidy number does not mean that you can magically go from one type of animal to another. From gerbil sized perissodactyls to rhinoceros sized brontotheres in 5 million years is not tenable. Our genomes do not change fast enough, especially mammalian genomes, especially the genomes of animals with long generation times or, or high mortality rates in, in genes that do not convey clear fitness advantage until all conditions are met. Because not all genes are Mendelian. Most are polygenic. They require multiple different changes to multiple different loci to be expressed. And until then, they really don't have that much of a fitness advantage or they have a minor fitness advantage. In which case, it, the, the less of the fitness advantage it has, if it's like, oh, well, you, I have 41 instead of 40, slight advantage there, yeah? It takes hundreds, if not thousands of generations for that gene to even reach an appreciable number of the population, let alone fixation, which may, may never occur. And yet you're claiming that all of this genomic change occurred and these animals had happened in all these different lineages. Some, not in some, like coelacanths and horseshoe crabs and frilled sharks. Nope, these niggas are the same forever. Random, random gene mutation stuff doesn't apply to them for one reason or the other, whatever. Living fossils, who cares? Doesn't count, ignore those. But in all these other lineages where you see radical change occur and then just not occur anymore, funny that, eh? What, what, what magic dirt stopped them from mutating? Magic trees, magic fruit. Well, what is this one piece that they eat? Like you know, gum gum fruit, and, and now they magically like tr like fucking you know pronghorn ate gum gum fruit. Now it becomes a giraffe. It's Lamarckism, at best, and straight up lunacy at worst. So it's like, what is the point of this autistic rant? What is the point of being on here for almost three hours? Ranting and raving with a lot of the same arguments being thrown back and forth, a lot of the same stuff being addressed. It's because their arguments are run out. If you watch this again and feel like I've said a lot of the same thing over and over again ad nauseum, it's because it needs to be said ad nauseum. Because if I don't say it ad nauseum, people just don't listen. They, they don't actually incorporate the knowledge. They don't understand that the argument is here, that the proof is in the pudding, that it is not difficult to disprove this evolutionist argument that when you pick the low hanging creationist fruit of a bunch of young earth creationists or whatever, then it, it's easy to blow off into something like intelligent design. But when you actually get into the meat and bones of evolutionism, suddenly it becomes very hard to defend. That's all I'm trying to say. So Clint and Stefan Milo and Aaron Ra, you guys do not have science on your side. I'm sorry. You don't have science on your side. You can't change the realities of population genetics, change the definition of science to fit your fucking whims, bro. You can't cherry pick the fossil record. You can't craft phy phylogenetic trees that beg the question based on shoddy data. Can't do it. And you sure as hell can't ignore genetic models. 
that disprove most of the shit that you say. The burden of proof is on you. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So this is basically like a three-hour response stream. I'm going to do more of these streams. This is a very rough one. This is me getting back on the horse. I want to respond more to these guys as I see them. And they could be short form. They could be long form. I'll include different creators. Most of these creators, by the way, are people I watch. So it, it's kind of grimy too because I know that like by including their names in the title, you know, I'm actually benefiting from that in views. And I admit it. I, you know, if he can grift his effing Patreon and stuff and talk about his lizard center, then, you know, I'll manipulate the algorithm to get more views. I don't, I have no shame about that. But in any sense, uh, I, I just want to respond. I'm like, I'm, I'm glad that he was responded, but I've had both Steven Milo and Clint respond to me. I think Aaron Ra's an idiot. Honestly, like the dude is so far away from being a scientist. It's not, it's not even funny, but you know, oh, the science reinforces my, it's like, no, it doesn't. But, um, but those are just the first three I'm going to cover. I might cover these guys again in the future, depending on what they put out. But Clint's already been testing me, man. Like this guy's already talking about straw man. This, this dude is like, you know, trying to pick on the kindergarten tier intelligent design people. Like he's, he's not even getting into like Anunnaki stuff. Like he's not even going into that territory. Uh, so he's, he's going after like the most tame and docile of people when it comes to an intelligent design or just non-evolutionist argument. And the funniest part is that his own evolutionist argument just crumbles. This shit just crumbles into dust when you actually look at it with a microscope and get beyond the fossils, get beyond the fossils, get beyond all the colorful slides and graphs and phylogenetic trees and look at the genome and you see this shit's impossible. When you actually take a look at the genome, none of it adds up. It's like once you get to the math, once you get to the data, the raw ass biomolecular data, suddenly just doesn't add up. Suddenly just doesn't hold water. And you're like, huh? But it's like this fossil looks like this fossil. This is, and then you realize, just like how I realized during my undergrad, it's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It's all theater. Once you actually look at the shit under a microscope, you realize it's all contrived. It's all manipulated. It's all being presented to you in a way to make it seem so damn conclusive. It looks so damn convincing on the surface, but you dig underneath that ice, man, that ice is thin as a motherfucker. Because once you get rid of all these layers and look right at the genome, you realize there's no fucking way. The base mutation rate is too damn, too damn astronomical. And when you actually look at species change, it's not anything like what you're getting now. Again, cats and lions have the same number of chromosomes, man. They're shuffling the same different types of genome alleles around. There's, again, very little real genomic differences within kinds. There's not really much genetic manipulation that really needs to go on to get a myriad of forms. But what these guys are proposing between forms, like C to land transition, the jump from single cell to multi cell, from multi cell to actual organism, these are astronomical odds. These, these are, this is bordering on the divine already. That they don't even have a god, they don't have a deity. Their deity is the soy jack like nutty professor sitting up there smoking his pipe so enlightened because he doesn't fall for this trick of alternative hypotheses he trusts the science but has to change the definition of science in order to trust it i i think it's so telling that clint literally designed created his own definition of what science is contrary to what exists and i feel like that in and of itself encapsulates the modern academic this dude's a phd and yet lies to you about the definition of what science is purposefully misleads you by throwing out a definition that is not congruent with the truth by picking and choosing which examples to use even when the argument is very clear and explicit even from these very simple young earth creationists that are very easy to disprove, or who are very misled because they, they interpret the Bible literally. It's written by a bunch of Jewish dudes in like the 6th century BC guys. Like, let's be real. There's a, there's a lot of stuff. The earth is not 6,000 years old. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that are easy to pick. They're, they're low-hanging fruit. And still, you can't just objectively approach their arguments and see where they're right. And for that reason, Clint, you know, I'm going to keep watching your content, man. But I'm going to keep flaming you on my channel until you start actually acting like a scientist and that's basically all i got again guys thanks for showing up to my stream 
I know it's been a minute. Again, I'm planning on getting back on the horse. I don't want to have another hiatus. I don't want the internet to go out either. But as you can see, not a single stream interruption. That is that new internet. My stream quality is better. Um, you know, my frame rate is better on my camera now. And I'm feeling, I'm feeling much better now about uh, being able to stream consistently from now on. So, you know, shout out to... I don't know. I shout out to IT, I guess. I'm like, it took these niggas long enough. I'm not really feeling, I'm grateful. I'm grateful, but I, I would have loved to have this in two months ago when I originally was trying to, you know, make the most of it. But anyway, back on the horse. Thanks everybody for showing up. I did see a decent number of people sl slide through throughout this stream. So I'm very happy for that. I hope people can go back and even a lot of stuff's been repeated intentionally because i know that people come on so that's actually a big reason why i repeat stuff so if anybody comes in like oh you just repeat the same shit over and over again i'm like one it's to reinforce the point and two it's for the new people that i see join the stream because i can see when somebody joins the stream yeah so i can see when somebody joins the stream so sometimes i'll just reiterate things because i notice when people come in and out so keep in mind that's why i do that uh again i'm open to comments questions debate anything like that if someone comes in like you're a fucking idiot you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. then again guys like if you see me in these comments if you're one of these people that comes through because they're interested you see the the name of a guy you like in the head titles and you're like oh he's just a fucking hater sit down and actually listen to what i have to say because i'm not hating just to be a hater i'm hating because these guys are full of shit and they're claiming to be scientists while making up <laughs> like literally clint's over here making up science He's making up a definition for science that is not found in any dictionary. But two can play at that game. And what I, what I love to do, man, is I love to beat these academics at their own fucking game. And that's why they won't, they won't touch me. Because one, I'm a literal who with like less than 115 subs. And also just the fact that I'm too dangerous. I'm too prickly. It's like I'm like a rare exotic plant that if you, if you touch it, like pokes the shit out of you. I'm like, you know, why would you go out of your way to deal with me? It's like easy. Go for the dandelions that grow everywhere and you can whack them. It's like, oh yeah, get, take that dandelion. But dude, I'm like a, I'm over here like a blackberry bush. I even look like a blackberry bush in person. I'm like, the fruit is sweet, bro. But yeah, yeah, I've been streaming so long the motion sensing cameras turned off. All right, guys. Well, there's my discord link, please. Uh, you know, if you want to tag in, that's cool. This link is probably going to expire after some time. And I also have work tomorrow. So I'm almost at the three hour point. Uh, if any content creator decides to come in and, you know, feature me on their channel, please go right ahead. I would love to go into open discourse, debate you on this. If you want to cherry pick what I say, then go right ahead. We can have a little back and forth. Uh, if you want to, you know, have me personally on your channel or something, or even just like make fun of me, go right ahead. There's nothing I said here that does not hold its own water. You can say, oh, your model's simplistic, your argument's simplistic, yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, you know I'm right. At the end of the day, you know that what the genome says, what mutation rates are, all of this is not congruent with what we see in the fossil record, especially the fossil record that you've cherry picked into creating this long lineage of different animals shape-shifting into one another. So microevolution is observable and testable. Macroevolution is a crock of dog shit along with abiogenesis. Both have been disproven. Both are not proven by genomics. Both are not even proven by the fossil record that you cherry pick. So with that, I bid you guys adieu and watch out what you're consuming on YouTube. Always question, never take this shit at face value because these guys are grifters. These guys make their money off this shit. They want you to think that we come from monkeys and pond scum, guys. They want you to think that the universe came from nothing because it's a fucking grift. Do you know how many copies that Stephen Hawking sold in his little like, I, I made, I became a millionaire because I sold 12 one and a half million copies of my black hole book and had no evidence to back up anything I said. Look, look how much money did Carl Sagan make? How much money did Richard Dawkins make? How much money does Stephen Hawking make? How much money does Michio Kaku make? How much money does Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye the Science Guy make? Peddling this shit. It's a grift. Remember the grift. 
Remember that Clint is a grifter. Steven Milo is a grifter. Aaron Ra is a grifter. These niggas make money off of gullible dumbasses who don't know any better. They are not men of science. They are snake oil salesmen. And with that, my brothers, my sisters, my they thems, I bid you farewell. Thanks for attending the stream. Fuck the haters. Uh, cash money. I don't know. My, my mouse isn't working. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. Now, one thing to leave off. Besides, like, ignore the grifters. I will, again, I did not announce this stream because I was not sure I was going to go. I was testing out the internet. Internet works. I will be announcing my streams from now on. So follow the Discord link. I'll be announcing my streams on Discord and as YouTube community posts. Also, Discord is a better way to bant. If you want to send memes, you can do whatever you want in there. But with that, guys, like really watch out for these grifters. These evolutionist guys are grifters. They're grifters. These are not scientists. They're grifters. Remember that every time you click on a YouTube channel that is monetized, it's a science like, oh, yay, science. All these Hank Greens and these Michio Kakus and these PBS niggas. It's all a grift. They're all making money off you. I don't care if it's as innocent as the Amoeba Sisters. These guys like Clint and Stefan and Ra are making money off you guys. Every single one of you that buys into their evolutionist bullshit, that, bu that buys into like, oh, you know, it's the science is settled, guys. And there's guys like me on YouTube making videos that go against them. That hurts their grift. That hurts their revenue stream these guys will scream like chimps and do whatever mental gymnastics they have to do to back up their theories because they making money just like how the catholic church made money off their indulgences they don't want you going protestant because now you won't get that sweet sweet tithe money it's the same shit with academics they don't want you questioning academia because suddenly people won't go to college and they won't pay that sweet sweet cash money they won't get those free grants and all that to research their bullshit like remember this is what this is what I'm going to go into when I talk about climate change because I'm not a full climate change denier. I'm just an anthropogenic climate change denier. Big difference. Climate change is real. Do humans don't really cause it though? But going into that argument, I, I meet a lot of people like because oh, their entire job is fundamentally based on climate change. Like I'm a wildlife rehabilitation or I'm a oh come on, the lights turned off. Anyway, my job is involved in conservation. I know for a fact that El Nino and La Nina events are responsible for what's going on, but oh my God, dude, turn the alarm back on. Yeah, my coworker just locked me in. All right, guys. Yeah, this is the second time in a row that my fucking dumbass co-workers have locked me in the building so yeah all right well with that i bid you guys farewell it's been a great time and there's a I, the lights turned off because my co-workers have uh locked me in so yeah take that as you will i fucking hate dealing with these niggas almost more than i hate dealing with creationists and the, all of these evolutionist dudes that you know again i would just wish people would use their brains the young earth creationists ignore science. The evolutionists ignore science. Remember, guys, just like I mentioned earlier, if life gives you gives you lemons, then make lemonade. If then hypotheses, induction, deduction, that's all that science is. Don't listen to the grifters. Don't listen to these assholes who want to make money off you. Use your brain and think creatively. Peace out.